please join us in the front. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were joining us. Um, maybe we can, well, good afternoon first, everyone. Um, I'm Nava Swirsky Sofer. I'll tell you a little more about myself in a moment. But since this is an intimate group, I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to learn about who's in the room with us. I understand that there are uh, a larger group of people joining us online um, that's being filmed over there. But if we can maybe start on the side. Um, I'd just like to know for my own benefit um, who you are, where you come from, so that it'll be helpful in the dialogue later on. Right. Okay, that's the new industry association? Okay, of the hundred and some companies. Okay. It's growing. Excellent. Excellent. That's a big number. Right. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, and are you a, a, a teacher or do you deal with the... Sorry, my Russian is non-existent. Okay. Okay, the analytical department. Thank you. Okay, I'm lost. Russian National Academy? Yeah. Executive Department. Ah, oh, that's a good idea. Hang on a minute. Bear with me. Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me this way? English? This way. Can you hear me? Channel number one, can you hear me? Please show if... Uh, okay. Tak. Vice Rector. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us from St. Petersburg. Uh, please give him the microphone, otherwise I don't hear him and cannot interpret for you. Okay, can you, is it better now? One, two, three, four. Yes, he has, he has to have a mic. Natalia Olpinik. Natalia Leonid has already introduced me to you. I'm from Belgorod, representing uh, Belgorod uh, State Technological University. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, because I don't want to hear myself, sorry. I'm going to take this off. I now have all the technical equipment necessary, and we can get uh, we can get started. Here's what I was thinking of doing. What I was thinking of doing is using we we have two lectures, but I know that it's the same audience, so we will treat these two lectures as one seminar, and work through um, several parts of this. Um, I would encourage you, please, very much, especially those of you here in the room, to ask questions. 
Um, I like questions. I prefer dialogue. Um, you no, know, you're not bothering me if you put your hand up. Um, it might take me a minute, but uh, I would like you to help me focus on the things that are most interesting to you. Because in consultation with the education department here, I've prepared a very broad overview going from innovation through a bit about the story of Israel, which I was told was interesting to the audience, talking about technology commercialization, models, practical tips, uh, intellectual property, um, licensing, and uh, spin-off agreements, and then going into the summary at the end. So um, I hope that we can cover everything you'd like to cover. It will be roughly three hours. We will have a break in the middle, but because we're a relatively small group, please feel free to put your hand up and uh, make any comment you'd like to make. Now, where was that thing? Okay, so I have all of this here so I can move forward. We'll start with, and now I do want a photograph because you know Moscow and everything. You offered to do the arts, right? You can just sit down, it's okay. It's a, it's a nice screen here behind us. But uh, what I'd like to, uh, to take you through first is a very brief overview of why innovate. I know you know this. Are we okay? That's fine. I know you know this, but um, I still want to focus on a few points here. Um, I promised I'd tell you a little more about myself. I have been on all sides of the innovation equation. I started out many years ago as a lawyer. Nobody's perfect. Um, I then got an MBA at one of the top schools in Europe at IMD. Ended up in the pharmaceutical industry at what is today Novartis, was then still SIBA as a vice president, uh, responsible for worldwide policy, and got involved there in the early days of investing in venture capital as a means to an end. So this was not venture capital as a financial investment, but it was investing in venture capital funds as a way to access new products for the company, which is something that's going to come back as we speak about innovation and funding models. Um, I moved to California to uh, engage in venture capital work, initially on behalf of CIBA, then as a partner in one of the big venture funds in California. I was fortunate to live there in the very happy days of the 90s, uh, pre-bubble, as the bubble was growing, but before it exploded. So it was a very exciting time to be in California. I moved back to Israel after a total of 10 years in Europe and the States. Uh, stayed in venture capital, started my own fund, um, started some companies, and um, then joined another big diversified fund, and was then asked to come and run the technology commercialization arm of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. I did that for a number of years, and for the last few years, I've been consulting to both companies and international organizations, government organizations mostly, on strategy and company building, but also on technology commercialization and innovation, um, and a lot of public speaking. Uh, I chair the National Nanotechnology Conference in Israel, and Rusnano has been a proud sponsor of the conference for the last few years, and we've had the various heads of Rusnano as they change over the years uh, join us at the conference. Um, it's uh, typically opened by President Paris, which is very high level. We have over a thousand people from over 30 countries, and clearly this is an area that's growing in importance. I'm very glad to hear you now have an association, so hopefully maybe we'll see some of companies as well as um, the officials who have joined us in the past. Um, and I've done a number of other things on the public side. I'm representative to the OECD Business and Industry Advisory Commission. Uh, I'm uh, an advisor to the United Nations World Intellectual Property Organizations, and so on and so forth. The rest you can find online. Um, but that puts me in an interesting position because I've been on all sides of this equation. Um, I teach, but I've done, and I still do, uh, and I'm still involved with companies, and uh, it gives a very interesting point of view on why we do what we do and why we innovate. Um, clearly, <laughs> We all know this, the world population is slated to grow by one third in a very short period of time. It's already started doing that, that's actually a 2010 slide, uh, but uh, we're already past seven billion, um, heading on to eight and growing very, very fast. That brings with it an unbelievable 
growth in technology and in the pace of technology. I apologize for the quality of the slide, but I think this is a good screen you can see. Um, what you have here is the various technological innovations over the years plotted on a time frame going all the way back to the agricultural revolution. And the point of the slide is very clearly how black it is and how fast it moves up on the right-hand side here. The pace of technological innovation over the past few decades has been faster, exponentially faster, than anything we've seen in the past. When I told my children that when I grew up there was no internet and we didn't have personal computers, we didn't even have cell phones, lo and behold, we couldn't communicate with our friends on Instagram and Facebook and what have you, they looked at me, and this was just a few years ago, they looked at me with a very concerned look and asked me whether we rode around in carriages with horses. So as far as they're concerned, it's the same, you know, it's the same pace of technological innovation, whereas, you know, to them they can't imagine a world without cell phones and very soon it'll be without Google Glass and uh, new types of innovation that are moving so, so quickly today. So we need to keep up. Um, we need to keep up in order to compete globally. We need to keep up in order to, um, uh, to compete not only on a national scale, so Russia versus China versus the US versus whatever the rest of the world or Israel, but also within countries and within regions, and we'll talk a little bit about what different regions do to innovate. We need to collaborate. I mean, that's fairly obvious, and the world is moving in that direction. Academia and industry, big companies and small companies, governments and the private sector. I was just, I was waiting for you. I just had an email from Geneva, uh, from the UNECE, and they're having a big conference on private-public partnerships as a means to fostering innovation. It's clearly the way the world is moving. We can't stay in these silos of private sector, government, public university, and so on. That's not happening anymore. There are new initiatives to foster innovation. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. I'm not going to take the time now. Um, but most importantly, new types of entities that are being formed. Please join us in the front. Um, new types of entities that are being formed in order to let these different stakeholders talk to each other. And the human component of all of this is absolutely essential because most of us grew up in one particular branch of this equation. We grew up in the private sector or in a public company or in academia and learning the different skill set that's necessary to move around is essential and that's really what this is all about. I like this definition of innovation and the reason I put it up is for a very, very simple reason. The process by which an idea or invention is translated into a good or service for which people will pay. Okay, those five words to me are the key. Because especially in academic innovation and invention, we very, very often have wonderful technologies that the world doesn't quite need, or in other words, no one will pay for. And that's always important to remember. I, I, I can regale you with very funny stories about technologies that nobody needs or nobody's willing to pay for. But, and I think that you probably all have come across similar things yourselves. But that is important to learn. We don't innovate for the sake of innovating. It's fun. It's wonderful. It's important. Basic research is essential. That's what moves the world forward. But when we're talking about innovation for business purposes, we have to remember that someone's going to buy this at the end of the day. So there has to be some utility that people are willing to pay for. And it is at that intersection of what the users want, what the technologies can do. And again, the green circle is a different way of saying what's viable in the marketplace, or in other words, what will people pay for? Remember this, because it's we always think it's obvious, but um, it's surprising how many products have gone out on the market that the world didn't need, and they flopped. Innovation distinguishes leaders from followers, the one and only Steve Jobs, who actually was able to convince us that we needed things we didn't even know we needed, but that's, of course, a different story. Um, a little bit about what leading countries and regions are doing to foster innovation. Okay, now I have sent copies of these presentations, so those of you who want a copy are welcome to have one for your own purposes. Um, it'll be easier than taking notes. Um, but the 
there's some very important things that have to happen. And a lot of these are actually happening in Russia today. The high-level focus, it has to come from the highest levels of government. I've been fortunate myself to have had a personal meeting last year with your prime minister, sat with Mr. Chubayas and a few others, like a student with a legal pad, took notes. Um, now, I don't know what happened after that, but I do know that it was the highest level of interest, that there was real commitment, there was no press, there was no, you know, this was, this was an actual working session with a group of people from around the world, a small group, five or six people, um, to really get to the basics of what's happening. That type of high-level focus is absolutely essential. Um, we, you, it's necessary to support R&D. Russia has traditionally had very, very strong technical and scientific skills. Now, I know that some of that was not maintained as it was, but still I think there is great technical and scientific strength and that needs to be supported. It needs to be supported locally and it also needs to be supported by mechanisms of international collaboration. And when I talk about Israel, one of the things that I'll mention is that most of our science is actually supported internationally by the European Union, by US grants, by international collaborations, because that's the way to keep up with the world. It can't be siloed. Supporting new companies and projects in smart ways, we'll talk more about it, I don't want to go into it now. And new innovation partnerships, which again we'll go into in great detail later on, ways to make this whole system work, ways of bringing people together from the different sides of the innovation equation that give everyone what they want and enable you to manage that process in a way that gets you faster to a product or service uh, that's profitable. The concept of open innovation is not new anymore, but it simply speaks to the same point, which is there is an opportunity here. Companies are looking outside. The pharmaceutical industry started doing this 25 years ago when they realized that they couldn't invent new drugs just within their own laboratories. They had to go outside. Other industries have followed suit today. International collaboration is obvious. Companies buy other companies, they collaborate with universities, they collaborate with companies. It's a hallmark of the innovation economy anywhere that it is successful in Silicon Valley, in Israel, in other parts of the world as well. Um, that presents a great opportunity for academia. And I'm sure the vice rector will agree with me. There's a great opportunity today for academia to use its strengths to feed into industry, into the business world, into the investment community, to provide it with this, to feed this hunger for innovation. We'll talk about some ways to make that happen. Uh, but there is certainly a skill set there that is useful to the business world. I like this quote from Ernst Hemingway, mostly because he comes from such a completely different world. But the point that he makes is a very important one. Now is no time to think of what you do not have. Think of what you can do with what you have. I often hear in countries around the world, oh, but we don't have this, but we don't know how to do that, but we don't have the skill set. Well, you know, Yes, there are a lot of things you don't have. There are a lot of things. Italy and Mexico and Canada and Kazakhstan, those are some of the places I was in the last few weeks. Um, and they all tell me what they don't have. But alongside the things you do not have are things you have. And the things that you have are where you start. The things that you have, if you had a technical skill, if you had expertise in a certain scientific area, if you have... Um, uh, expertise in design, if you have expertise in physics, whatever you have, that's where you start. And then the rest grows, there's a ripple effect from that. So, and the positive thinking helps the people who are doing this work to really move forward. Because we all want to see results. We don't want to sit and think of what we could have or would like to have or would train people to have in the future. So that's actually an important point. And of course, it is those who change who survive. And we know that, Charles Darwin said that much better than I do. Here's what we're going to cover today. Okay, that was just a very brief introduction. We'll talk a little bit about Israel. We'll talk about technology transfer and commercialization. 
that's where I'll need your help, okay? Because I'd like you to give me some pointers as to how deep you'd like to go into some of those mechanisms. We'll talk briefly about intellectual property. I think I'll keep that fairly brief today. That's a fairly technical presentation. Um, and again, I'll answer any questions, but we don't have to go into all the details of that today. Industry academia collaborations, that section is fairly specific. I was asked to give tips and pointers, and that is quite specific. Again, we can go into as much detail as you're interested in having at that point. Um, licensing versus spin-off companies and a wrap-up at the end, and we'll try and do all of that in a little under three hours. Now I need help, maybe from Constantine, to get part two up. That was just for technical reasons. I sent each part through separately, so they are in separate presentations. It's just number two. Thank you. Okay. Now Israel, and this is just to give you, to tell, I'm telling you a story. Okay, and this is a story, it's an interesting story, it's a fun story to tell because we all like positive stories. It's not without its challenges, especially moving forward. But I'll try and give you just a brief story of where we come from and why it is that people want to hear about the story of Israel. And of course, there's a very big element that's connected to Russia and the former Soviet Union here as well. Israel has become known as the startup nation. I couldn't find a Russian translation of this book, but I thought there was, so maybe I couldn't find it. But in any event, this is a book that was written a few years ago. I had the uh, honor of being interviewed and quoted in it. But it tells the story of Israeli innovation and how Israel became known as this startup nation in a very compelling manner. So I recommend it to anyone who wants some light reading. This is not academic professional reading. It's light reading, it's easy to read. Uh, but it tells the story in a very entertaining way and in a way that's quite compelling. It's a bestseller, it's translated into languages like Thai and Polish. That's why I was surprised that I didn't find the Russian, but again, I could have just not found it. Um, these are some of the technologies that have been invented in Israel over the past 20 years or so, and they really go across the board. They go from agriculture, which is partly where we started, um, cherry tomatoes, peppers, those seeds were developed for uh, particular varietals um, at the Faculty of Agriculture at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We'll talk about that when we talk about tech transfer as well, because they make money still to this day for the university. Um, there are medications, medications for cancer, the world's first nanotechnology medication actually, called Doxil, it's up there in the middle, used for cancer, ovarian and other types of cancer that was developed at the Hebrew University. Uh, flash memory, uh, for memory sticks that we all use and for other types, a uh, company called M Systems that was acquired by SanDisk, that was developed at the Tel Aviv University. Given imaging, top left, developed a pill that includes a small camera in it. That's very, very cool. It looks about, it's a pill about so big, so like a large antibiotic pill, if you will. And inside it has a tiny camera. That's a camera that was developed for a missile head. When you swallow that pill, it provides, well, pictures of your insides uh, for diagnostic purposes. And uh, that company was actually sold last week for about a billion dollars to Covidian. Um, but it's an example not only of invention and innovation, but also of the particular skill in Israel, sorry, of using uh, military technology for civilian applications. Where is the camera? Given imaging, sorry? Given imaging, it's called, it's a top left, given imaging. Um, and that's a camera in a pill. It's called the pill cam. Some of the other things that uh, pink and blue logo there is checkpoint software technology. That was the world's first firewall for computers. We all have firewalls on our computers now, but checkpoint was developed by three friends who served in the Israeli military together and started working there on this solution. It is still today the market leader in firewalls and uh, a large company still based in Israel, still independent traded um, both in Israel and on NASDAQ. Um, going up just in the top middle there, Netafim is the company that developed drip irrigation. And not a huge problem here, but a very big problem in Israel and in other countries that don't have much water. In order to water 
our agriculture and our gardens and so on, we have pipes with small holes in them, and that, of course, is how we all water our gardens. Um, the technology, particularly the valves that open and close, um, those were developed in Israel, partly at the university, partly by uh, an independent engineer at the time. And um, I'm just going to give you two more examples, maybe. One is Waze. Is anyone familiar with Waze? Waze is a, is a navigation, uh, a cell, cellular-based navigation uh, application uh, that is socially based. So it doesn't just tell you, you know, GPS, the road goes here or there, but the users, there's a very large user community of over 50 million people around the world that puts in information as you go along and you get points and there's a whole sort of social system around it um, and it's very very effective especially where there are a lot of users because that makes it more effective otherwise you know it has the maps and so on and so forth it was developed specifically to be uh, available to you on your cell phone so it's always available wherever you drive um, and it was developed interestingly enough thinking of the daily commuter so it's it, it's not just looking at a tourist going somewhere you don't know and um, you want to get somewhere. But you drive to work every day. I drive to work every day. I know the road. But this will send me a different way every day, depending on the traffic, depending on what's happening, depending on whether this road works. And what you're doing, if you think of it, uh, what you're doing is you're creating a community because once you've done it a few times and you see that it helps you, you'll use it all the time. And once you use it, you're probably more likely to input and to get output, and so you're creating this whole social experience. Waze was acquired by Google for a billion dollars in cash in June of this year. Um, so I think you may see it integrated into their systems fairly soon. And last but not least, a company called PrimeSense, which appeals to the nano people in the room. Those are sensors. Those are the sensors behind the Microsoft the Connect systems, you know, for um, games at this point. PrimeSense was acquired by Apple. Uh, two, three weeks ago for um, about $350 million. And um, those products are already integrated in the systems, but I think you'll see a lot more of them in the new games and uh, applications. There's lots more, but I think that gives you an idea of quite a lot that has come out of uh, you know, one fairly small country in a relatively short period of time. We spend a lot of money on R&D. As a country, we spend over double the OECD average, which is in the middle there in, uh, in uh, blue. And uh, we continue to spend a lot of money. It's true that our GDP is you know, not that big. It's not a very big country. But still, we're looking at about 4.5% of GDP, which is a very, very large uh, amount for a country to spend. Um, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but the summary of the slide is we rank today in the top or one of the top places on all the parameters that are relevant for innovation and for international competitiveness. So it's international outlook, it's the availability of skilled workforce, it's, um, it's funding. Israel today has the second highest availability of venture capital after the US. We also have the second largest number of companies traded on NASDAQ, on the stock exchange where technology companies are typically traded. Um, and those are absolute numbers. So coming from a small country, they're very impressive. And all of that, of course, world-class science, Nobel Prizes, and so on and so forth. That is not, however, where we started. Israel was founded in 1948. It was a small country. Well, that gives you a relative size. We had to put a circle around Israel. It's the squiggle in the middle. And then, of course, I think that's got all of the former. Uh, uh, it came up as Russia, but I think that it's a little bigger than it should be. Um, it's a new country. It was isolated. It's still isolated politically. And it has no natural resources, not even water. The only thing we do now have, which is a very recent discovery, is a little bit of uh, natural gas. Our first gas pipeline started operating. It started flowing six months ago. It's still a small amount, and time will tell. But that's very, very new. We never had any natural resources until now, which you know is one form of innovation, finding the only corner of the Middle East with no gas or oil. So life handed us lemons. Here's what happened. As a small country, Israel has developed a very strong culture of interdisciplinary collaboration, which today 
countries, universities, research institutes are trying to create artificially. You're trying to get your physicists to work with your biologists, your social scientists to work with your engineers. It's very hard to do. In Israel, because it was a small country, also because it was new, people talk to each other. It creates that sort of atmosphere. And that's what enables this transfer of ideas and technologies across boundaries, which otherwise really are fairly siloed, certainly in academia. That's one thing that happened. Um, as a new country, a number of things happened. One is we have no strong traditions. We have no strong traditions. Now, you might think that's not a good thing because we haven't made olive oil in the same way for 500 years or we haven't built machines in the same way for a certain number of years or we haven't traded in the same way for 200 years. But what that creates is an openness to change by default because you know we've never done this, so let's go find the best way to do this. And that's very typical in Israel. People will say, sit and say, okay, let's do this. Let's find the best way to do this. This very rarely do they fall back on a tradition, mostly because it doesn't exist. An isolated country, we know, um, we're not very popular with our neighbors, has created a number of things. One is strong military capabilities. It's a given, it's something that we've done. But what happened out of those military capabilities is very interesting, and it's two things, okay? One is technology. Obviously, technology we talked about. Checkpoint, I talked about given imaging, which is taking technologies that are developed for the military and using them in civilian applications. There are lots of good examples, especially in the medical field. Mapping technologies, sensing technologies, all used today for medical devices and one of the foundations of Israel's medical device industry, which has been quite successful. But the second thing that has happened, and again, I don't think anyone planned this, it's something that we look back and say, well, this happened, um, is training. Because we have conscription, because all young Israeli people, men and women, have to serve in the military for a minimum of two years for women and three for men, it's usually longer if you're an officer or if you're in certain professions. Um, I myself am a retired captain of the Israel Defense Forces. I was there for a little longer. Um, but because we all serve in the military at a young age, we develop problem-solving skills, teamwork skills, we learn to deal with adversity. We grow up, and we grow up maybe a little too fast, but you grow up, because if you're 20 or 21 and you have to lead a group of people, you grow up. And that creates a skill set that's very relevant for the startup world, if you think of it. It's almost the hallmarks of what you want in a management team of a startup. Now, again, no one set out, hi, please join us in the front, there's lots of room. Um, but we develop those skill sets and we use them today. And they've just happened because of the way Israel developed. But the second point out here is very important, and that is the international outlook. Israel's a small market. It's physically very small. Um, it's got today about 8 million people, um, but it started out with 600,000 people. There is no sizable local market. When an Israeli company is founded, it doesn't even look at the local market. It doesn't sit down and say, what's our international strategy? Do we have an international strategy? It's a given that your strategy is international. The question becomes, do you start in the US? Do you start in Asia? Do you start in a certain part of Europe, Latin America, whatever? That is a question and that's something that we deal with. But it's international by default. And if you think of other successful countries, maybe not so much on the innovation side, but on the business side, think of Switzerland, for example, same thing. Very small local market, very big international companies, because again, the world is your oyster, so to speak. Israeli companies work in English. Hebrew is not a very popular language on the international scene. Um, they work in English. The emails are in English. I mean, you speak Hebrew, that would be sort of artificial, but all of the written communication is in English, all of the manuals are in English, but even the emails are in English. The calendars are in English. Because you know that 
very soon you'll be collaborating with an international company and you need to be able to communicate. It's not even a question anymore. And it's one of the things that's been very important in the growth of Israel and in the growth of the Israeli high-tech society. Um, publications, academic publications, it's all in English. There is nothing relevant in Hebrew. Um, and, and that is something that if you go to China, for example, there is some very good science, but a lot of it is in Chinese, or it's Mandarin, whatever, but it doesn't get out. Now, it's true, it's one very large country, but it still doesn't get out to the rest of the world. Whereas Israel has very, very high publication indices, very high ratings on all the world rankings of universities and publications and so on, it's all out there. A lot of it is also very good, but it's all out there. Language is important in this case. So that's another thing that has happened as a result of being small and being isolated. No natural resource as well. Clearly, brain power. We all have Jewish mothers, so we all have higher education. Goes without saying. Um, but uh, also, of course, it develops a culture of innovation. Alongside with um, immigration, we have grown from 600,000 to 8 million in 65 years. That is a very, very high growth rate for any country. Um, over a million of those are people who came from this part of the world, uh, around 91 or so. Um, when Israel had 5 million people, by the way, so a million people into the Israeli workforce mostly highly skilled, a lot of engineers, technically skilled people. That was a huge challenge. And one of the outcomes of that, interestingly enough, is our incubator system. We have a system of 26 incubators that the companies receive support from the government. The incubators today are private. They were government owned, but they've been privatized. And everybody thinks this is an invention that was meant to foster our innovation economy. But in actual fact, these were created to provide jobs for the immigrants from the former USSR. Most of them had technical capabilities. A lot of them had ideas or technologies that they wanted to develop. Israel could not grow its workforce by 20% in one year. It just was not possible. So one of the things that was done was providing a small amount of funding. It was $200,000 a year over two years, sometimes a third year, to let people develop their ideas and maybe create their own workplace and maybe even create a workplace for some other people. Today, that's evolved into a very important part of our innovation system, but it started out as a job creation scheme. So if you look at all of this, we developed a culture of innovation, which was our way of taking those lemons I showed you earlier and making lemonade. Um, that's really, in a nutshell, how this all happened. We had some smart government intervention programs. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I want to mention one, um, which is the venture capital industry. The Israeli venture capital industry, again, was created by government intervention in 1992. There was one venture fund in Israel, and nobody really knew what it was. And the Israeli government put $100 million into 10 funds that had to bring 60% of the funding from abroad and had to be associated with an established venture capital firm outside of Israel with a local team that would grow. And that is the foundation of what is today the world's second largest venture industry as an industry. So we can go into the details of that. It's an interesting story. I know there were some attempts in Russia to do something similar, uh, even with some of the same people. But that is a very interesting story, not just because it was successful, but because when it was successful, the government pulled out. The venture industry in Israel has been completely private for at least 15 years. There's no government intervention. And, and it's very successful. Now, the government is considering intervening in certain sectors today biotechnology, for example, which is very long-term and requires a significant investment, and sometimes you need to provide an incentive to investors to come into that sector. But on the whole, it's a very, very successful private industry today. We've got other programs that evolve, and they evolve in response to needs. So if there's a need for early-stage funding or a need to help multinational companies uh, to encourage them to come to Israel rather than to other countries. All of that is done in an evolving manner. Um, these are some of the programs. I'm not going to go into them right now. And one example, because it's relevant as we sit here in the offices of Rosnano, is our nanotechnology industry. 
Our National Nanotechnology Initiative started about 10 years ago. And it started because we had some capabilities. After all, nanotechnology is not 10 years old. It's older than that. Uh, the medication I showed you earlier is already off patent. It's over 20 years old. But, uh, but nobody called it nanotechnology, and it didn't exist as a, as, a, as a field unto itself. When it started evolving as a field unto itself, uh, the concept was let's create a strength. It's something that we have capabilities in, and with a relatively modest investment, we can create a strength. And what was done is we created six centers at the leading universities in Israel, the leading research universities in Israel, which are all public. Those centers were funded one-third by the government, one-third by the university in which they sat, and one-third by philanthropic contributions, so donations, from people who named, typically named the centers after themselves. Um, the first center started operating in 2005, but most of them started in 2007. And uh, I'll show you the results of the first five years of that program, which have led to a second term being approved last year. Now, one of the interesting things that you can see here is not just that we have excellent people and over 6,000 publications and uh, very, very good academic work. But you'll see throughout all of these parameters that one of the important things, one of the important milestones was a series of, uh, of uh, goals that had to do with industry collaboration in a field that's really very much based on basic research. 20% of those publications, as you can see, about 1,200 publications out of the over 6,000 are in collaboration with industry. And we're talking publications in nature and science and so on, so it's basic science, it's not applied research, but still in collaboration with industry. Um, there are almost 200 what we call success stories, which are either products licensed or companies started. Um, there are granted patents, again, a fairly large number for such a short time frame. There are um, faculty members who have been recruited, and that's an important element for us. We suffer from brain drain in Israel. We train lots of wonderful academics, and we don't have enough jobs for them in academia afterwards. So they typically go abroad for their postdoc and never come back. Uh, so one of the goals here, and you can see that number up there in, in red, with a red arrow, uh, was to bring back each one of the centers had to recruit two tenured positions per year of top people from abroad. And as you can see, that number was even exceeded. And uh, those people today are some of the backbone of the next generation of scientists working in these six nano centers. So to me, and again, you know, the numbers and scientists and so on and so forth, but the key element here is that the collaboration with industry was foreseen at the beginning. It's one of the milestones. It's how I became involved in this because I was running the technology commercialization arm of the Hebrew University. And I was looking for new technologies, you know, new projects, new ideas. And I started seeing things coming out of the nano center. And I also knew that the nano center wanted these reports from us on numbers of patents and so on. They wanted this whole industry side we provided to them. And then when I looked at it more carefully, I realized that not only were there exciting technologies, but they also have to work with industry. The equipment, which of course is very expensive, is shared with industry. So companies can come and they timeshare, you know, like MRI machines at hospitals. They timeshare, they can come and use it at night or in the evening and so on because the equipment sits there and they can use it. So that creates a very interesting collaborative culture between the academic centers and industry. These are some of the new companies, the smaller companies. These are some of the bigger companies working in nanotechnology. That's all available online, interesting maybe for the association. Um, and our next fourth conference will be in Tel Aviv at the end of March of next year. And hopefully, again, we'll see some people. And I'm hoping to see more companies this time. We have collaborations today with Rusnano and also with Skolkovo, actually, um, that uh, have active projects. But we'd also like to see many more companies coming. Um, if I summarize the innovation recipe here, and this I'm going to go through very briefly because I want to get into the mechanics of the tech transfer. Um, there are three elements to it, really. You have to have the infrastructure. That's obvious. 
you have to have the environment that sponsors or supports innovation, but mostly you have to have the culture. And if I break those down into what elements they're made of, the infrastructure is fairly obvious. You have to have an educated workforce, you have to have innovative research, you have to have something to work with. You know, I was approached recently by some African countries. They want to create an innovation economy. Everybody wants to create an innovation economy. Infrastructure, however, well, a little more challenging, shall we say. They have some things, but a little more challenging than you know, countries with an established scientific uh, background, um, like, of course, you have here or in other countries. You need the funding, you need an intellectual property system. Those are all things that you know, most developed countries have in place. You need the right environment. It's regulation, it's the tax incentives, it's you know the ability to invest and so on. Which again, if you look, most countries have most of this and sometimes you can tweak some of the elements that you don't have. But most importantly, you need the culture and that is usually, usually the biggest challenge because most countries do have old habits. I'll, I'll give you an example that's far away from here but equally cold, Canada. Canada has excellent research. It really does. And um, it has all of those things that are mentioned. It's also financially very stable. Didn't even have a crisis in 2008. Very, very stable. But you know what? Life is very, very comfortable in Canada. Life is good. And when life is good, you know, you don't have the incentive to do something new, to start a company, to take a risk. Taking risk is difficult to do. And I've sat on all different boards and the board of their Center of Excellence for Commercialization of Research and, and, and so on. And the government has poured tons of money into this, both federally and in the different uh, provinces, in Ontario, in Toronto, in Quebec, mostly around Montreal. They created hundreds of companies, but the culture still is not there. I was on the board of a, an early stage venture fund there on the um, investment committee, and it was so hard to convince people to take this risk, to, to make this difference, to really go one step ahead because the culture just wasn't there. And that's very often the case, most European countries as well. Most European countries, you know, sort of if you look at Italy or you look at France, life maybe is not as good as it was, not at the moment, but still, they're used to doing things in a certain way. It's very hard to break with old habits. And that really is um, uh, an important point. But the hardest thing for everyone is the risk of failure. And it is impossible to innovate without failing. We have all failed. Some spectacular failures, some smaller failures. It's not about not failing. It's about learning from your failures. It's about coming up again and saying, yes, I had a company, it didn't succeed. This is why it didn't succeed and this is what I've learned. And as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, I heard this all the time. And the first time it was surprising to me because I moved to Silicon Valley from Switzerland. Switzerland's not a country where you fail. It's very, you know, very solid. People don't take risks, they don't have to again. Think Canada, very comfortable life. Um, that changed, by the way, it changed. When people started losing their jobs, they started companies because suddenly they had nothing to lose. The risk was, you know, the perception of risk was different. But, uh, and I think you're gonna see a lot of that in Southern Europe now because the economies are so bad. You know, half of the Spanish population is unemployed. Italy's going through a terrible crisis. So suddenly this becomes a viable alternative because life isn't safe anymore. But failing is just part of the game. And I know it's hard and I know it's very, very hard in a culture that is based on the public sector and state provided employment and life that maybe isn't always as comfortable, but it's safe. It's taking away that safety net that's so hard for people to accept. And we can talk a little about that because I think that some of the places you start are the people who have less of a safety net, the graduates, the recent graduates, um, the people you know, coming out with their PhDs who might not have a university position, you can offer them 
um, a way of starting something new. There are ways to overcome this, but that is the most important uh, element, and there are no shortcuts. It just has to happen in order for a certain area, it doesn't have to be a whole country, it can be a certain area, it can be a certain region, to create an innovation culture. So that's just a summary of what we've all said, but it's about making the best use of what resources you have available, focusing on the areas you have that are areas of strength, importing the best practices, which we'll talk about in the next section, uh, but also understanding that changing the culture just takes time. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And countries where it has happened, it has taken time. Um, and actually, there are some very good examples, again, in Switzerland of such change. In, for example, in the area around Basel, which was the heart of the uh, pharmaceutical industry, when those companies started being acquired and sold and merging and so on, people came out. Yes, they had programs that were attractive to let people take technologies and start companies, but it created a whole industry that wasn't there 20 years ago. It just wasn't there. And it happened because they had to adapt to change. The safety net went away in the manner that it had been in the past. And it's very, very interesting to watch that happening. And the reason that it's so encouraging is that it's happened in so many other places. It can happen, you know, in the areas that you're interested in. Questions before we move on to part three, while Constantine helps me bring up part three. just walked in. I'd like them to sit in the front. Sorry. Questions? Everything. We'll move into the third part, which is successful university tech transfer and commercialization. Now, this is quite technical, but it doesn't have to be. So please, I'd like your guidance as to how much detail you'd like me to go into on um, all of these. This is where we are. We'll talk about tools, intermediaries, and best practices. Um, this is just, it's a definition that I took from Wikipedia because I thought it was interesting as to you know, how the world saw this whole process of technology transfer. And it was interesting to me because, of course, they try to be very broad. I had the funny experience of sitting at the World Bank in a big two-day um, meeting on technology transfer, and some of the people from the, well, lesser developed countries, they don't call them lesser developed countries, they have some beautiful name for them, but they were lesser developed countries. When they talked about technology transfer, they were actually talking about bringing factories to their countries so that people had, you know, jobs and a skill set. Completely different definition from what we have when we're looking at excellent technical universities looking to commercialize their technology. Um, so there are a lot of different aspects to it. But what we're looking at at the end, again, is very similar to that first definition of innovation that I put up, which is exploiting the technology into new products, processes, applications, materials, or services, and I would add, for which people will pay. The valley of death is not unique to Russia. It's not unique to Israel. It's not unique to the US. It's absolutely global. We all suffer from the same challenge. There is academic research, which is curiosity-based. It's publicly funded. At its best, it's not trying to solve any particular practical problem, but it's guided by the desire and the curiosity to solve some sort of uh, question, conundrum that's not necessarily of a practical nature. That's on the one side of the chasm. On the other side, we have commercial enterprises. They're focused on what the market needs. They have investors. They want to make money. They need products. They need to sell their products. They create companies that have a whole governance system, which is, of course, completely different. Now, if you think of it, after all, in the business world, it's very easy. You make money, and you're graded, if you will, on how much money you make and how much money you invest and what the return on investment. It's numbers, very easy. The academic world is so completely different, because after what are you graded on? It's not money. 
its publications, it's the ranking of the university based on all sorts of things. That's why so often there's so much ego at play because it is so difficult to define these things. And these two worlds, well, have a hard time talking to each other because at the middle, there's a technology risk, there's a market risk, and it's not on the slide, but I would put in very big red letters there, there's a huge cultural gap. And that's, this is universal. There's not a country in the world where you put up the slide and people don't go, ah, well, you know, everybody has the same problem. The classic technology transfer model, we'll talk about this, it's the US model because it's best known around the world. I'll then talk a little about the Israeli model because we are actually a lot more successful as a system, not you know, as a system. And uh, I'll talk about new collaborative models that are emerging. The US model is really very simple. It is based on a piece of legislation from 1980, the Bayh-Dole Act, which most of you are familiar with. Am I correct? Some of you are familiar with? Who is familiar with? Okay. The Bayh-Dole Act was a piece of legislation from 1980 that gave universities, because we'll start with, research is typically publicly funded by various federal agencies in the case of the US. And because they fund the research, they own the results. Until 1980, those research results were never commercialized. They sat there. They were published, but they were never commercialized. So this piece of legislation aimed to do something very interesting. It aimed to give the universities the ability to commercialize this research, to make money on the research, to bring that money back into the system, and it reserved the right for the government, mostly the federal government in this case, to use those research results for its own purposes if it needs them. So those will typically be defense, but also maybe energy and so on. So those are the basics of the Beidol Act, okay? Um, and another important element is the ability to share with the inventor, with the professor, the upside, the money that you make. Now, this is very interesting. This was uh, sadly the latest slide. Uh, they don't, the statistics are a little behind. But if you look at the number of institutions that were doing tech transfer in the US, okay? So you can see in the 70s, there were less than eight, okay? 1980 is the Beidol Act. Then you see a big period of growth, new ones every year. And tapering off mostly because most of them had already sort of joined in. So tapering off towards the end. It's a classic push model. That is, we invented something. We have an invention, 10 inventions, 100 inventions. Now we're going to go out and see who needs them. We're going to push them out. So if you look at this, you've got your R&D, creating inventions. You assess the inventions. You protect them with intellectual property. We'll talk about that. You market them, so you try and find someone who needs them. Hopefully you license them. It results in a product or service that pay royalties and some sort of development income, and that goes back into the cycle. Classic model. With lots of programs associated with it, again, I can leave you this. We don't need to go uh, into all of the details. It's some explanation of the different phases. But the, the point at the end of the day is, there's no market here. You're talking to yourself, okay? I mean, you do talk to the market at the marketing phase, but by that stage, you already have something. You've protected it. You have a patent. And now, you know, it's like if you think you're going to a shop and there are all these things on the shelf, okay? And you have the shop, you, the university, or the shop, and then, you know, you try and get the buyers to come in and say, look, we have this, it's very beautiful, and that one can do this, and so. That is the classic model. It's pretty dead now, but it's the classic model. The typical structure in US universities has a technology licensing office within the university. So these are university administrators who've been pushed into a, some sort of a different track, 
and they run this technology licensing office. They work for the university. They have university salaries. They have university tenure. They have university incentives, i.e. none that are relevant to the business world. And they're trying to do business. It's very challenging. It's very, very challenging. Um, this is typically what they do. Usually they have a separate office that deals with industry collaborations and we'll talk about industry collaborations because those are becoming very, very important and a very important part of what's happening today. But it's very, very, very much based on pushing out what we have and trying to find who needs it. Sorry, my arrow's gone. But. This beautiful slide comes from the University Technology Transfer Association of Japan. I like it. It's very Japanese. It goes every which way. But it actually says very much the same thing as we saw before, okay? It's the outline of a technology licensing office operation with the patent applications, the licensing, royalty income, and so on and so forth. But again, you see, it's got researchers here. It's got companies there. But the whole thing is very much focused around the technology licensing office, what we have to sell. And once again, the cycle of intellectual property creation, which is a rather nice uh, depiction of the invention, the interview, patenting, marketing, licensing, royalty, and R&D. But again, all in the classic model. Ours is a little bit different, okay? Now, Israel is a world pioneer in technology transfer. Remember the Beidol Act 1980? Well, Israel's been doing technology transfer since 1959. We established our first tech transfer company at the Weizmann Institute of Science over 50 years ago. And actually, Chaim Weizmann, who was the first president of Israel, was the inventor of, or the discoverer, I would say, of acetone, which was used in uh, World War I uh, in firearms and, uh, and explosives. So he had some knowledge of why this might be important and why this might be relevant as well for a university. We have today two of the world's top technology transfer companies. And when I say top technology transfer companies, I mean in absolute dollar terms of income, not per anything. Um, there's Yeda at the Weizmann Institute. Yeda means knowledge. There's Yisum, which means application at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which I used to run. Um, and each of those, I can talk about Yisum because those are numbers I'm familiar with. Um, but to give you an example, when the Hebrew University of Jerusalem had a research budget of $100 million a year, Yisum was bringing in $60 million. $60 million. Stanford, MIT, same year, research budgets of a billion and a billion one dollars. Income of 45 and 48 million dollars, respectively. So these are impressive numbers for Israel, very, very impressive numbers. There are over 22 billion dollars worth of products sold that were invented at the Hebrew, uh, sorry, at all universities in Israel every year. That brings in hundreds of millions in uh, licensing revenues and other collaborative revenues. And some of the products I've talked about before, but I'm going to tell you one extra fact on this slide, which is very interesting. I, I don't know how to say multiple sclerosis in Russian, but I'm assuming the translator has a very terrible disease. Over half of the world's multiple sclerosis patients everywhere around the world today use medications that were developed in Israeli academic institutions. That's an amazing statistic. Different medications, they're not the same medication. There's a series of medications that are different from each other, but all developed in Israeli academic institutions. They're um, down there. And by the way, that card that looks like a credit card is the, um, is the uh, transmission cards for cable television the NDS algorithms that were developed at the Weizmann Institute of Science. So it's not only biotech and uh, agriculture. Now, our model has always been a little different. Again, to be fair, this happened to us a little by chance. It happened for tax and other legal reasons. But our technology transfer companies are set up as companies, not offices. So it's not a branch, uh, an office within the university. It's set up as a separate company that's wholly owned by the university, governed by an independent board of directors, 
and most importantly, has its own employment policies, its own hiring and firing policies. So you're not employing university administrators who have no business background, but you can hire people out of the business world to do business with their colleagues. It makes a huge difference. It's a very important element. The boards of directors, they're typically voluntary boards. People don't get paid to sit on these boards of directors. Uh, but they have the top, top, top business people. Because at the end of the day, it's something people want to give back to. It's a way of giving back to the university, if you will. You've become a successful business person. You're happy to sit on the board and contribute uh, a little bit of your time once in, say, a couple of months. Um, we have clear intellectual property ownership. All intellectual property, all patents, and other types of intellectual property developed at Israeli academic institutions by its staff are owned by the institution. They're actually under agreement owned by the technology transfer company so that you can commercialize and you can do deals and so on. But at the same time, we have a very generous revenue sharing policy. So 40 to 60% of the revenue goes to the researcher. There are academics at Israeli institutions who've made millions, many millions, out of their inventions. And that's wonderful, because that encourages other people. It shows them what can happen. And these are very, very good academics. They're not you know, people who are not successful in the academic track. They're just very successful on the commercial track as well. And another very, very important element I mentioned before that most U.S. universities have a separate technology licensing office and a separate industry collaboration office. We do it all in the same place because the concept of a one-stop shop for industry is essential today. Some of my best collaborations between the university and industrial companies came out of a small industry collaboration, even a service agreement, a small R&D agreement. There wasn't even intellectual property involved in the early stages. But we got them to work with us. We started working together because we had a skill set that they wanted. And once you start working together, you develop maybe intellectual property, you develop inventions, there are innovations, and you start creating a structure that at the end of the day will pay back not just for the actual research, but also royalties and maybe equity and so on. That's a very important concept. And in fact, when an Israeli colleague of mine took over the management of tech transfer at Harvard University in Cambridge, that was the first change he made, was to put everything under one roof. Because in today's world, with the types of collaborations that we're seeing, you need to be able to offer your industrial partners, not just, remember the shop with the things on the shelf? You need to ask them what they'd like to see on the shelf. You need to develop those things that are going to go on the shelf together with them. And then they're more likely to buy them when they finally get to the shelf. In fact, they won't even get to the shelf. They'll buy them earlier on. But that is the type of relationship that works with industry today. It's not the old-fashioned, let us do this, and then you come and take it from here. It's not so much a relay, you know, like in a race. It's more, there's a lot of running alongside. There's a lot of working together. Sorry. The last point here is important. We're focused on royalties. Yes, we have spin-off companies. Spin-off companies, in my own experience, usually around 10% of university-based inventions are relevant for the creation of a spin-off company. The rest of the 90%, let's say 80 to 90%, might be very interesting, they might be very good, they might even make a lot of money, but they should be licensed out to an existing company. They don't necessarily support the creation of a new company. Because a company needs more than one product or one small incremental invention. Whereas an existing company, it fits into what they have. It might work very well. So that's a point we're going to get back to later when we talk about mechanics. Um, that was just an example that I can give because I know these numbers and I'm committed to talk about them. Uh, some of the other institutions don't like to talk about their numbers. So 
you know, it's a it's an institutional policy question. But that just gives you an idea. That's one university, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which was founded before the State of Israel, by the way. It was founded in 1925 by Albert Einstein. And it had on its first board of governors Martin Buber and Sigmund Freund. So it had good beginnings. The university today conducts about 30% of all research in Israel across the board. Um, and uh, in 1964, so almost 50 years ago, it founded its technology transfer company. And these are some of its numbers in one of the years for which I could speak to. There are over 7,000 patents, over 2, 000, covering over 2,000 inventions, over 500 licenses, and um, 72 active existing spin-off companies that, is, that are still in business uh, today. Products that are very successful and uh, many others coming up behind them with very innovative funding mechanisms in place today. Um, we can talk about that maybe a little later. I wanted to give an example of what we did over a three-year period to grow the revenues from 34 million to 60 million. And uh, maybe I'll talk about that when we talk about the mechanics uh, and how we did that, signed 1,200 agreements in those three years. So the key success factors, as far as I'm concerned, the first is providing this one-stop shop for industry, the ability to go from collaborative research to licensing with the same people, with the same team in the same place, essential. Going from what they need to what we can offer. Not, this is what we have, do you need it? But a better understanding of what the industry wants out there. The second point is an ongoing dialogue with the marketplace. Obvious? Yes. Essential? Absolutely. Today, it's done through your website and through the social networks and through the uh, social media and through various types of fairly well-targeted marketing activities, but also face-to-face, -face ongoing discussions. Uh, I've got a whole series of actual measures that I'll share with you in a moment. Meetings, industry councils, and so on. You have to create the right environment, and the right environment is the tricky part. It's a business-focused organization that has operational independence. And yes, sometimes these people will make more money than the university administrators. That's okay, that's fine. As long as they're bringing in money, they can make money. It's okay. In order to attract the right type of staff, you need to bring them in on business terms. They're not going to come and work as university administrators, necessarily. You need to have clear intellectual property ownership. That, again, goes without saying. You can't do a deal if the IP is part owned by the researcher or it's not clear who has title to it and so on. You need, I think, to have a generous revenue sharing policy. I think that if you want to get the professors to collaborate with you, they have to know that you're going to do the work and they're going to make a lot of money if it's successful. And that's why they should help you. They should provide the support that's needed. Sometimes it's more research, sometimes it's working with the company. There are all sorts of things they need to provide in order to make this successful. You obviously need to have an excellent team that has relevant industry experience. And at the end of the day, you can have all of that, but it helps if you get lucky. It helps if you have a few projects that really hit the jackpot. And most successful universities around the world have two or three products, sometimes one or two products, that make most of their money. So, you know, just to put us back. Let's talk a little about the new collaborative models that are growing, that are, you know, in some ways similar to the Israeli model. In some ways, they take it to the next step. And it has to do, again, with going from the proof of the technological concept, okay, it works, to the proof of market need. And I know I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, because that really is the crux of what this is all about. Do we need it? Who's going to pay for it? Is it a product that someone actually wants? Because the fact that we can do it is nice, but, you know, may not be relevant. How about that? That's even more complicated. But, um, but what this tries to say is actually not that complicated. What it tries to say is this. That yellow mustard part on the left, okay, is looking at more at the you know, university side. 
The green part on the right is looking more at the market side. The proof of concept, developing the product, the prototype, proving that it's relevant in the marketplace, making the technology investment grade. Okay, getting the technology to the point that someone's willing to invest in it. A classic, classic, classic issue. The university says, we have this technology, and the investor or the industry says, well, that's very nice, but it's not ready. And that goes back to that first slide on this section of that gap. The understanding of what the other side needs, that's partly why you need that ongoing dialogue, because the idea of a university professor of what a technology is, is not the same idea that an R&D person in a company has. They're looking sometimes for something different. And bridging that gap can be a challenge. Once you transfer the technology to industry, sometimes you create a spin-off, sometimes you don't. That's why there are two arrows down there. It generates equity, royalties, licensing fees into the next generation, into reinvestment, and, uh, and back into that loop of virtue. Now one of the key players in all of this are new types of organizations. Some people call innovation intermediaries. I like to call them commercialization catalysts, mostly because it's a more dynamic phrase. That is, an intermediary to me is someone who sits in the middle, a catalyst is someone who actually helps get things done. And what you're trying to do is bring together the university the marketplace, the investors, and the government. Because in most countries, research is typically publicly funded. A lot of the support programs are publicly funded. And that's OK. Nobody has a problem with government as long as that role is played together with the other players and it goes out into the marketplace. Now, what you try and do with an organization like that, or how you turn an existing organization into a commercialization catalyst, is I think the interesting part. Obviously, there's a liaison function between these four different entities that we've talked about before. And sometimes these four different entities are not just four. You know, the government can be eight different entities. It can be different offices, it can be different agencies, but they have to be factored in because sometimes they can provide funding, sometimes they can provide assistance, sometimes they can provide, sorry? Oh. Uh, sometimes they can provide international contact, and they should be used. We need to obviously understand what the market needs and that takes us from the classic push concept into the modern pool concept, that is, tell us what you need and let's go and find it for you. Classic, classic, classic change that's happening today. And, and again, I can give you a personal example from, uh, from that period, which is we would ask companies to give us a wish list. You know, most large companies have a wish list. They ask, thank you. Yeah, that, 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 good idea. Um, might be a little more entertaining otherwise, but still. Um, give us a wish list. Tell us what you need. Most large companies have a wish list that's very detailed. And they can tell you not just what they're looking for, but also within a given technological area, what they're not interested in. So if you ask Merck Sharp and Dome, the pharmaceutical company, they have such a list that exists, it's uh, not even very secret. Um, and they'll tell you, yes, we're looking for technology in, for example, the monoclonal antibody area, but not this, that, and the other. That makes your job much easier because you know what you're looking for. You know what they're looking for. You know what might be attractive and what might start a dialogue. Remember, once you've started the dialogue, then relationships can take you in many different ways. But it's starting the dialogue that's always challenging, getting the company, hooking them into working with you and creating a relationship. Government support I've talked about, where needed, where helpful, not against it. Providing attractive opportunities to investors is a challenge. Now, I spent most of my career as a venture capitalist, at least in terms of time. Most venture firms don't invest in university-based technologies, not directly. I mean, maybe later on, but not directly. It's too early. There's not a good enough team. They would need to spend too much time and energy. It might require a skill set that they don't have. 
because very often they don't have that skill set. They can't manage an early stage company. They need a good team in place that knows what it's doing before they can come in. Sometimes there are a few players, and I, my fund in California was such a, a, a firm that specialized in early stage investing. So we did university-based deals. About 80% of our deals were very first rounds. But the people came from a very special background. People had that very early stage startup background and different investment model, and it was very successful. It made a lot of money. But most funds are not like that. And so finding something that answers to the needs of those investors, even just bringing them in and asking them what they might be interested in if you had it, is a very valuable exercise for a university because it'll let you take them to the next level. It'll let you help your own researchers, your own personnel, understand what they should be aiming at, even if they can't provide it at this particular point in time. Interacting with large companies goes without saying. It's you know the second uh, part of that. But large companies know what they want. They have wish lists. They have strategies. They have R&D plans. They know what they want. They also usually know where the holes are. I mean, what they need to find outside. Because you're not usually going to find today large companies that don't already understand that they need to collaborate with small companies, with academia, with that, you know, that's behind us. That was 20 years ago. Today they all know and they all look for these collaborations. Maintaining those relationships on an ongoing basis, and we'll talk about some of the tools, absolutely essential. So that you, sitting in the middle, can bring these pieces together and, and create deals at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do. And at the end, if you do that successfully, you use the academic resources better, you're able to make more money, and you're also creating a dynamic process. And dynamic processes have a way of feeding themselves. Because once a company sees that you can provide them with something, and once a university sees that you can provide them with funding and with contacts and with royalty streams and development funding, then everybody wants to start working together. And it becomes uh, a vibrant hub. And that's really what we're trying to create now. Some examples of interactive tools for academia. Some of them I'm sure you know, some of them maybe less so. Start at the bottom, if you will, or as the far left, service agreements for industry. Very, very simple fee for service. You do X, I pay Y. Typically, no intellectual property involved in these things, typically, because you're providing a service, each side has its own intellectual property, and that's typically where it stays. The next step up from that are sponsored research projects. So company will pay X amount of money. The researcher will do work Y. There can be intellectual property involved in this because you're using something that you have, but you typically, in such an agreement, sort that out in advance. You're not trying to license anything at this point. You're trying to get something done that might eventually have a benefit or a product, but it'll be further down the line. The next step up from that are collaborative research agreements. Those already involve people working together, actually working together, not just the company paying and the university researcher working, but researchers on both sides working together in a collaborative manner to solve a particular problem or to develop a particular technology. Once you do that, you typically have some intellectual property that both sides bring, each side brings, and also sometimes new intellectual property, new patents, new discoveries that will be developed together. We can talk, if you like, in more detail about how you manage that. Joint ventures, that's a step up. Joint venture, you're creating a company to develop a particular technology that has come out of all of this. I want to give you an example. I started a dialogue at the Hebrew University with Merck, not the drug company, the German Merck, KGAA. They are, among other things, the world leaders in liquid, liquid crystal displays, LCD displays, 75% of the LCD market they supply from their chemical division. 
And they were interested in a particular piece of research. We had a patent, but I, you know, calling it a technology would be even a little of a bit of an exaggeration. It was very early stage technology, but of all the things we showed them, that's what they took an interest in. So we said, fine. And we started with a very, very small agreement, not a service agreement, but a sponsored research project. And it was highly successful. So they wanted to do a collaborative research project, which we did. And the next stage was they said, look, we're prepared to do a, do a joint venture with you. We set up a company, they funded it, they put all the money into it, we put the technology into it. That company today is quite successful, it's developing a product, it has a commercial relationship with Merck, it also has the ability to have other commercial relationships, as the case may be for things that they don't want. In the middle, going back to the previous slide, we got some government support through the program for multinationals and through the regular R&D support mechanisms that we have. So that was extra funding, so not just from the company, also from the government. And now they're going out to raise venture capital because now it's already you know, an established company, it's got technology, it's got product, and it's got a client, a good client too. So that's one example, and that happened quite quickly. It all happened in less than two years. So those are those first things. Licensing can be either exclusive or non-exclusive. Classic examples of non-exclusive DNA splicing, for example. The Watson Crick patents, non-exclusive. Everybody can use them. PCR technology that was uh, developed in San Francisco. Again, licensed out. Everybody can use it, but they have to pay a royalty. Exclusive licenses, all of the things I showed you before. All exclusive licenses. So one company takes them, pays all the royalties. There are lots of useful tools for creating these types of collaboration. And you can think of them of going, you know, as going sort of top to bottom on the company side. Starting with CEO circles. So you bring in the top heads of maybe eight or ten companies for breakfast on a quarterly basis with the chancellor, the vice chancellor. And you create a dialogue, it's very high level, but it creates a certain commitment, it creates knowledge, they'll tell you what the big trends are, and it helps to trickle down, it helps to create a commitment at a very high level. Industry advisory circles, those are more specific. And there I would take people who are maybe VP R&D or R&D directors, people who know what the company's after at a high enough level strategically, but still focused enough so that they can give you real input. Put them together with the university, put them together with the commercialization catalyst. Get everyone in a room together. This doesn't have to be a two-day seminar, okay? It shouldn't be because then it becomes heavy and it becomes people don't want to do it. They don't want to spend the time. But if you invite them for an afternoon, drinks, you know, an hour, an hour and a half in the evening, you have a structured discussion, you have an interaction, you show them something exciting every time, one or two exciting things, and you get input from them. That becomes a very, very useful tool. And again, when you have an invention, you can access these people. They're a phone call away. You know them, they're your friends. Open research days, again, classic mechanism, bring them all in. That's a big fair, you know, that requires a lot of work and preparation. Very successful, we'll talk about that in a minute. Road shows, we'll talk about as well. Two types, either you go out with your technologies and visit people, or you bring people in to visit you on specific areas. Not a broad research day, but very focused. And of course, the online dialogue that we talked about before and all the different tools that it provides. Um, I thought, if I've got my timing right, we should be, is that mine? We should be about ready. Ha! Huh. I thought it was an hour and a half. It is. Uh, we should be about ready for a short break. Coffee, and we'll continue. А можно не спросить? Sure, sure. Just give her the earphone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hold on, can you hear me? 
Just show if you can hear me. Is it okay, Nava? Can you hear me? Nava, can you hear me? Okay, very good. I would like to ask, you spoke about new model of innovations. What are the specific features of this new model? It all seems quite obvious that you have to go to the industry, to interact with the industry, to collaborate with the industry. We're also trying to do it. I'm Deputy Dean of the Faculty of um, Innovation Technological Business of Russian Academy of Public Service. But why are you successful and we are not? What are the peculiar features of the model that allows you to be successful? There are a number of things and most of them are actually coming up in section five, which is the next section. The specifics of what I mentioned before. Before I mentioned a whole list, industry council, CEO circle, research days. So the next presentation is many details on that. Will that be helpful? So maybe we'll go through that and then we can have a more detailed discussion after we go through the details of the different tools, I call them. They're not really models, they're tools within a model. Um, but some of the things that I mentioned, they might be obvious, they might be obvious, but they're not, as far as I know, happening here now. Um, the structure that you have, that I've seen, from the little that I've seen, for technology transfer is still very much within the university and with university administrators. That's a very, very important element and it's very hard to change because university personnel is different. They, they look for different things. They're not business people. It's not good or bad. It's just different. And if you want to do business, you need to speak the language of business. And that requires different people. And so when I talked about the structure of the company earlier, or the innovation intermediary, if you want to have a more holistic approach, you have to have people there who speak the language of business, who come from business, and who are incentivized to do business. And that's very, very hard to do in most universities, even in Israeli universities, and they've been doing it for 50 years. I know. I know how much I had to fight to pay big bonuses to my staff with my board. And my board was a business board. But it's always hard for people to say, well, but we're gonna pay these people more than we pay the president of the university. Well, yes, because they're measured on different parameters and they can get a good job in a company. And if we want them to do that good job for us, we need to pay them. So that's always those little things are very big challenges. And you need to have the understanding, but also the structure in place to enable you to get these people to do the work. And that's usually the biggest challenge all over the world, is getting the right people to do the work, because it's very hard work. I always joke, I say, everybody hates you when you do this job, because the industry always thinks they can get it for cheaper, right? And the professors usually think that if you're successful, what? Well, because they're brilliant and they had a wonderful idea. And if you're not successful, but you're an idiot, you don't know how to commercialize, you can never win. But it, and really it is, it's not just a joke, it's one of the toughest things to do. But you need to be able to communicate and to do deals and to know the structure. And that's not your typical university administrator. And it's not enough to have good lawyers outside and accountants and consultants and advisors. That's not enough. In the end, the people who are doing the work need to be able to get the deals done. And that's the biggest challenge. So if you ask me one thing, it's the people. Many things we're going to talk about, structures, tools, and so on. But if you need to isolate one factor, it's usually the people. And to many researchers, 
even still today in 2013, almost 14. Applied research and commercialization are, you know, second best. They don't look at it as being something exciting. They'd like to have the money, but it's not what they're really after. And I understand that. But so you need to have the support systems and the people who can make that happen and use the academic skills, let the academics do what they do best, but take, it, take the business aspects to the next level. So that's um, a big challenge, still for us, even today. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, as far as I understood, the devil is in the details. So you have to look for details and we'll wait for the details in your presentation. Thank you. In the details, but also again, in the very basic structure and the very basic concept of who does what. Okay, that, that which is not a detail. It's, it's very basic and it's very, very hard to change. Because the one thing about technology commercialization that's so hard is that you have to invest for a long time before you start reaping the benefits. Most technology transfer companies, if you looked at them as a separate entity, even in the US, they lose money. It costs you more to run them than they bring in most universities. Very few universities that make money. Also in Israel, two universities make money and the others one more maybe. The others, they do all sorts of things. They put all the commercial activities, for example. One university has everything, the cafeteria, um, the, um, the publishing house, everything is within this one company so that they can show revenues. But that means you also have to manage it. So, you know, another university has all of the continuing education programs, you know, programs they do for, for business people and for others within, under the management of this company. Again, to make money. But then you have to manage that and it's a different business. But if you're looking at the actual tech transfer activities, those are not easy to make money on. And it requires an investment for a few years before you start making money. And for most universities, they don't have spare cash. It's hard for them to make that commitment and to make that investment. But there are other tools that they can use. And mostly you need a commitment because I think that if you have a strong technological base and you have the commitment, then there are ways of making it work more quickly, I'd say, than waiting for a licensing stream or revenue stream to come in, you know, 10 years later. Because obviously in today's world, no one's going to work for 10 years. I always joke and say that one of the reasons that Israel is successful today is that we've been doing this for more than 50 years, technology transfer. So we made all the mistakes when nobody was looking. And now that the world is interested in this, well, you know, we're already very experienced. After all, when you're in your 50s, you've made most of those mistakes, right? So now we're, we reap the benefits. But it is a big challenge. I think we can continue. No? Yeah? And take that off. Okay, um, we'll continue. And again, here I want some guidance from you because this next section, I was asked to talk specifically about intellectual property and I'm happy to do so. Um, but I think that in the interest of leaving enough time for a dialogue about the actual tools, maybe we'll do this a little more quickly or with less detail and leave more time for discussion. We can always revisit this. It's up here on the screen and we can go back to it because it's quite technical and maybe most of you know this or maybe most of you don't need to know this. But um, the idea was really to cover this as, as a background to going back into a more detailed discussion of some of the models. Um, this is obvious. 
Successful research results go two ways. One is, of course, publication, and that's the mainstay of academic research. Publish or perish, right? You publish for the greater good of knowledge, you publish for the institutional reputation, for your personal reputation, and of course for your promotion. That's what academic life is based on. The other side is intellectual property, which can be, um, of course, in addition to, it is not instead of publication, and that is a common problem that we all deal with. Submitting a patent application doesn't harm your publication. It just requires doing it a little before, because once it's published, of course, you can't submit a patent application. There's financial value, there's the potential for commercialization, and in most university-based research, you are talking about classic intellectual property, i.e. in this case, patents, most university research. We will talk mostly about patents, okay? But there are all these other types of intellectual property. I know that there are mostly uh, also uh, common and available in Russia as well as in other countries. Uh, they're less common, mostly uh, the common type of intellectual property is patents, and so that is why we will focus on the first one on that list, but just to say lots of others. Coca-Cola, for example, has an incredibly strong trademark and trade secret, um, and it's not patented. The Coca-Cola uh, formula is not patented. Know-how Again, classic Coca-Cola example, uh, but there are others as well. Um, they're all valid. They're all important. They're very hard to trade because it's very hard to you know, put a value and get royalties, for example. And that's why for now, for the purposes of today's discussion, we will focus on patents. We can always discuss the others later on. Now, I like this one, you know. I call it zero. Two cavemen with the round stone. So it's always a question of what you've invented and who invented it first. Maybe that was the first zero. Who knows? It looks to be before the, uh, the Arabian numbers, so maybe. Um, but what is a patent? Okay, really, we're looking at the exclusivity to use your invention for a given period of time, which typically is 20 years, varies a little. In a specific country, again, very important and very expensive. Well, we'll get to that because, of course, we have to uh, protect it country by country. Um, it protects against the use, the manufacture, the sale, and the import of uh, the patent-protected product in that particular country. But the patent is a negative right. It's a negative right. It protects you against others. It does not necessarily give you the right to use your invention. That's where the question, the next slide will come in and we'll talk about the question of freedom to operate. Because even if you have a patent, you can't use it if you infringe on the rights of others. And that's you know, very challenging. It's very obvious, but it can sometimes be a very, very big issue, especially in complex medical and technical issues. And we've all seen, we've seen the patent litigation between Apple and Samsung. I mean, these are giant companies with huge R&D departments, massive patent budgets, and yet battling in court for some very, very basic technologies because there are cross patents and cross licenses that are required. This illustration, rather an illustration of how a negative type, but since it seems to be obvious to the audience, I'm going to move on. I'm happy to talk about it if, uh, if you want, but it's, it's mostly um, to show the difference between when you can actually practice your patent and when you are um, prevented from doing so by the rights of others. What can be patented? might not want to patent because they're hard to protect. There's a very diff big difference between being able to patent something. Classic example is a computer algorithm. Yes, it can be patented, but I wish you luck in enforcing that patent in the marketplace. Very, very hard to enforce a patent on computer algorithms. It's also possible to invent a new use of a known patent. That's very common in the pharmaceutical industry. 
For example, aspirin. Aspirin was patented, but aspirin was patented 120 years ago. It's off patent for many years. So what do you do? You get a patent on a manufacturing uh, process, or you get a patent on the use of the existing drug for a new application if it's not known, and so on and so forth, various ways. But again, long list of things we can go through. Uh, we don't have to. If there are questions, I'm happy to uh, discuss them. Some difficult issues, transgenic animals and plants in some countries, big issue. Not going to go into it right now. And also methods of doing business, again, big issue. What very often happens, especially with startup companies, is they patent a lot of things that are not necessarily enforceable. But it looks good. They like to say we have 25 patents. They like to say we have patents in 20 countries. Um, for universities in particular, and for, for those of you who are in that field, patents become very expensive very quickly. And so you need to think carefully of what you're patenting, where you're patenting it, and how you're going to get your money back, because that is a very, very big issue. What cannot be patented again? long list of things that cannot be patented in any country or in most countries. The obvious rules of nature and immoral inventions, for example. Um, big question there, of course, was embryonic stem cells. Less relevant now because we are able to produce uh, stem cells from adult cells, so that becomes less of an issue in the actual marketplace. The patent issue is still an issue. It's actually still being, uh, it's still being deliberated, but the practical issue has mostly gone away. Um, but uh, again, databases can't be patented. Animals and plants produced by biological as opposed to transgenic methods can't be patented, and so on. Um, the conditions, I think most of you know, it has to be useful, which takes us all the way back to for which people will pay, remember? It's, it's the patent equivalent. It has to be useful. It can't just be new and exciting. It also has to have a use. It has to be novel. It has to be completely new. That's why you can't have published it before. That goes to novelty. It has to be non-obvious. And you'd be surprised at how many patents actually fail on the obviousness. Because today so much is known that it, very often an examiner will say, well, okay, but this is obvious. You've done A and B, therefore C is obvious. Not an easy thing. There has to be an enabling description. There's a nice one there for the first bicycles. There has to be a written description, um, which proves that you actually had the invention. That just goes to obviousness to say, so you see, Your Honor, says the scientist to the judge, it's obvious. I'm not sure the judge thinks it's obvious, but that's, of course, to be deliberated. In biotechnology, we have some very special issues, and I don't think any of you deal specifically in biotechnology. Do you? The dean? The deputy dean? No, not specifically in biotechnology, so I'm going to skip the slide. It's very complicated, um, and we don't have to go into it right now, but it's also very interesting. Um, there were some issues in the U.S. that have just been changed. What rights the patents grants you? Okay, the patent grants you the right to prevent others from doing certain things. As we said, it's a negative right. Okay. But, again, very importantly, only in the country where the patent is granted. And although we have international patent treaties, you still then have to protect in each one of the countries. Let's talk for a moment about freedom to practice, big issue. The question is basically, can I practice my invention without trespassing the rights of others? I have a patent. However, this is a very, very complex issue, and that is traditionally where most of these litigations end up, is on the question of freedom to practice. It's obviously in the territory, it obviously requires equivalence of the patent, but also the question should be in respect to the particular product based on the patent that you have. Again, I have a comparison here of patentability versus freedom to operate, which goes into the two different things that you have to look at. We all look at the things on the left. You search for universal prior art. Prior art, that means, has anyone done this before? Patents, publications, posters, whatever, obvious. You consider the invention. You consider only the novel elements of the invention. And, of course, 
you know, what's the cost of mistake is you lose the cost of filing a patent. However, when you look at freedom to operate, you need to look at valid patents in the territory. You need to look at the product, not the invention. So the overall product. It's possible that you produce a product based on your patent, but it infringes on someone else's rights in another aspect of the product. You need to consider all the elements. And of course, the cost of mistake here is much higher because you could have to pay damages to someone else, not just the filing of your own patent. Sections of the patent, not gonna go into this. I don't think this is um, a technical audience. Um, but I do want to say one word about why we file many patents on one particular technology. And the reason we do that is a tactical, strategic business reason. It is not an intellectual property reason. The reason we do that is we typically file a broad patent, and we then go in, if you will, if you think of the house, okay, you build the house, and then you build the walls around it, and then you build the ramps around it, and then you build the moat around it. You're trying to protect that basic patent. Very often you'll end up with, for example, uh, the last patent to e to exist after the others have expired will be to do with a delivery system of a potential, let's say we took the example before of aspirin, but not aspirin, a particular drug. The patent on the molecule is expired. The patent on the production process is expired. You end up with a patent on a particular delivery system. For example, it was a pill. Now it's in a patch. You have a patent on the patch and on that molecule in the patch. And that'll give you another two or three years, which of course is very relevant because it keeps others out of the marketplace. You have to protect the specific product. It raises the costs because each patent is expensive in and of itself, but it certainly decreases competition. If you can protect your product broadly enough, it keeps the competition out of the marketplace. Let's talk a little bit about money. You're talking about $300,000 US for a patent. Sometimes more, that's a very low average, a low uh, estimate, okay? With most of that coming in in the first five years. Young companies will typically allocate up to 15% of their R&D budget to intellectual property. Startups, it can be much higher. I've seen startups as high as 50% of their budget go for intellectual property in the beginning because they want to create something that actually lasts. Um, and then, of course, the figure decreases as the companies become more established. But this is particularly relevant when you're talking about a university, for example, because a university doesn't have that sort of money to spend, and I argue should not spend that sort of money either. I'll talk in a minute about what I think universities should do. That just breaks down the typical cost of how we got to that, just as an example of a few countries at the bottom, uh, the translation costs and so on and so forth, how long it takes, how long it takes to um, uh, examine the patents, but it's not terribly relevant right now. Um, there are other relevant forms of, IT, of IP that can be relevant for the sorts of things you do, particularly the second design or model, very relevant in ICT today becoming more relevant because hard to protect with patents per se. And of course, know-how, which is difficult to protect, but uh, it's a different, different discussion. Let's talk about what I think is the appropriate IP management strategy for a university. And it's a funnel approach. And this is designed to give you maximum protection at minimum cost. It's not a low cost, but it's minimal considering what you're protecting. Initially, we protect very broadly. Mostly, um, in certainly Israeli universities, we use a lot of provisional patents. And what the provisional does is absolutely nothing. It only preserves a date. It doesn't really do anything else. But what it means is that if for that first year there is no publication, then you can file again and you've, got, you've essentially preserved the date. And if there is a publication, then you have to file full patent, but you've preserved the date. Other than that, it does absolutely nothing. So let's remember, when people tell you, and very often young companies tell you, well, we've submitted 20 provisional patent applications, useless, covers nothing. Typically, also, they're not drafted. So there's really very little substance. You can't even see what it is they're trying to protect. But the advantage is it's very, very cheap. 
You can submit it even online. It can cost you as little as $100. You can even submit paper. And I have done that sometimes when a paper was about to be published and for some reason it fell through the cracks and we didn't see it. So we took the paper and we sent it in with, as a, you know, with a provisional application, even online, to just to get the priority date for the patent. Once those 12 months are over, and that's a 12-month period, then typically again in Israel and most other countries, not the US, the Americans look at the world in you know, American, with American glasses, so they submit only in the US. And then they have terrible trouble because it's not protected anywhere else, but that's a different discussion. In Israel, we tend to use PCTs, so the Patent uh, uh, Cooperation Treaty, and that gives you the opportunity to protect your patent in those countries, so close to 30 countries today, and 18 months to do so. So there's an 18 month time frame there that gives you that protection and at the end of which you have to choose which countries you actually want to protect your patent in. Now a PCT in Israel you're looking at that already has to be drafted. So you're looking at essentially the drafting cost typically five to ten thousand dollars per patent, so per PCT application. It's not cheap, but it's an amount of money that you know can be managed, depending on how many of these you're going to submit every year, but it can be managed. Then comes the national phase. So another 18 months go by, then comes the national phase. And the national phase is where you choose which countries you actually want to go for, and that's where it becomes expensive. It becomes expensive in filing costs, it becomes expensive in translation costs, it becomes expensive in legal fees, patent attorney's fees. Uh, that's where it becomes expensive. The choice of countries depends on where you might be doing business. The choice of countries for a pharmaceutical product is not the same as it is for a sensor or for something to do with mobile phones, where obviously you have to have Korea and Taiwan and some other countries that you don't normally have, maybe for, say, a drug. But it requires some serious thinking as to where it is you're going to protect. Now, on the left there, those three bullet points are tremendously important. And they go to the um, details, if you will, of uh, the management of this process within a university, okay? You need to have a very clear decision-making mechanism. I believe in decision-making mechanisms because they make it easier for you to make decisions and they make the decisions more acceptable to your academic staff and to your business staff as well. It needs to be clear how you make those decisions. You need to get relevant industry input in each phase, particularly for me in the second phase, in the PCT phase. Because in my own mind, most university intellectual property should be licensed out or should at least find a partner in that PCT phase. Because remember that your business partner, your industry partner, will then pay the costs of the patents. So then that expensive bit at the bottom goes off your P&L. Those 18 months of that green phase, that's where your staff works very, very hard to find the appropriate partner. And in order to do that, you need to have all the mechanisms in place that we're going to talk about in a minute. And you need to have a constant dialogue making sure that there's actually something that people want. Sometimes there will be technologies that you won't be able to find a partner for, but you will decide to protect and take that risk and the cost of the expensive national phase in selected countries. And that happens usually when you have something that you're convinced is very forward thinking that the rest of the world may not have caught on to, that you think is the next phase for industry. That's the nature of academic research. Academic research can be very forward looking. It is possible that something is now being done in academia that the business world hasn't caught on to. It is possible. But those decisions have to be made very carefully. Because it's natural, mostly for the academic in question, the person who's doing this work, to say, well, 
I'm way ahead of the game. The world hasn't caught on to what I'm doing yet. And sometimes that's true. But sometimes it's not true. Sometimes it's just that the world is in a different place. And what they're working on might be very interesting, but going back to that very first slide, it's not something anyone will be willing to pay for. And you're asked to make that decision. And it's a difficult decision. It's an expensive decision because once you make a commitment in the national affairs, you can always abandon it. But you're putting a lot of money to work, a lot of money for a university for sure. I spent $2 million a year on patents. Okay, a lot of money. Made us very popular with the patent firms. Also enabled us to get very big discounts. But, um, but we had that money to spend. We were making enough money to spend that money. When you don't have enough money to spend, these become very difficult decisions to make. Because this really is your investment in the future. This is your R&D investment, if you will. The equivalent of your R&D investment. Becomes very, very difficult. But that classic approach, and you'd be surprised, it's very obvious I know um, the dean will say, and, and yes, it is very obvious, but you would be surprised at how few institutions actually exercise the discipline that this requires. Because it's very, very, very hard to say to someone, we're not going to continue to support your patent. We don't think it's commercially viable. It's almost easier not to do it at the beginning than it is to stop in the middle. But it needs to be done. So very briefly summarizing this section, it's an asset. It's an asset that you have. You have it on your books. It has a value. It's worth having if it has merit. It can be sold or it can be rented, which is the licensing process. Uh, most universities don't sell patents. Remember that most universities don't sell patents. It goes back to the basic ethos, remember, of saying, the universities are really managing this estate of intellectual property for the public because the public paid for this research and the universities are just trying to make the best of it so that they can do more research. And therefore, if it's not quote unquote yours, then it's not yours to sell. This has become a big issue in recent years with the emergence of what we call patent trolls these companies that come in and buy up lots and lots of patents and create bundles that prevent companies from working in certain areas. It's become a big issue, and yet, and, and there's been a backlash by a lot of the research universities saying, A, we don't want to work with them, and B, that's not what we're about. We're not about trying to hoard patents to prevent people from doing things. Our mission is to use this to enable the public to benefit from the fruit of the research that the public funded. Because in the end of the day, it's, published, it's funded by our tax payments. Our tax payments, American tax payments, European tax payments, but everybody else's tax payments. So that's, that's one element. The second element is, of course, the question of cost, which we've discussed, and the importance of rigorous decision making. And the third one is remembering all of those negative things. If you do hit the jackpot, it pays back for many, many, many years. And it keeps, there are universities that are in business because they make money on their inventions. So it is worth investing in creating a system that works for you. I want to now move on to the mechanics of the industry academia collaborations with the help of someone who can put on section five. Can you do that? Thank you. So I hope that wasn't too much detail, but I just wanted to mention in particular that funnel, which is, I know, a lot easier said than done. So mechanics. By way of background, I think universities are undergoing a very interesting and difficult transition phase. Because if in the past one looked at universities as, as uh, institutes of higher learning and research, today they're being put on the spot and being asked to do other things as well. They're being asked to provide an engine for innovation.
They're being asked to provide an engine for economic growth and for regional development with technology parks and startups and companies rising around. They're being asked to support national goals in certain areas. Countries that are looking at, say, alternative energy or looking at uh, solving their water issues and are looking to their universities to provide help with those. That goes way beyond the classic, simple, if you will, goal of teaching and researching for the sake of research. This is a big challenge. At the same time, around the world, public funding is declining. Big issue. Issue in Russia, issue in Israel. Israel today is dependent on European funding for its research. We are members of the European funding programs, FP7, and now Horizon 2020. Um, now, luckily, our research is good. And our research is so good that we pay less than we get. So we're making money, if you will. Okay, we, we put in what we have to put in because there's a pro rata system. And we get out on competitive basis more than we put in. So we're doing okay so far. But that's where most of our funding is coming from. It's not actually coming from the Israeli taxpayer. And, even, and, and less is coming from the American taxpayer that's changed. So around the world, and I see this in many different countries, universities are dealing with the challenge of becoming more self-sufficient. Not entirely self-sufficient maybe, but more self-sufficient. The question becomes how? How do you take an institution that's used to doing certain things and do other things without losing? Because nobody wants universities to lose their basic functions of teaching and research. That I have seen universities, there's one particular example that I saw in New Zealand of a university that really turned itself into a service, a contract research institute. It provided all types of service research for industry. And they were making a lot of money. But in the process, they were doing so little basic research that eventually, you know, someone said, well, let's think about this. We're making money, but are we making money for what we're supposed to make money for? Because we're not actually maintaining our basic goal of doing blue sky research. One solution is to work with industry, which has defined market needs. It can offer you beta sites for the work that you're doing, be it water purification, be it new types of... Uh, of uh, computer hardware or new types of optical cables or new types of materials. Industry can offer beta sites. That's actually one very interesting way of collaborating because there's relatively little money ch changing hands, but there's a lot of know-how and support that comes from that. It can provide testing and, of course, the first clients. They can develop the products beyond the initial research phase. And, of course, they can share in the profits when the time comes, and everybody's happy about that. Step one is forging this collaborative dialogue, which we started talking about earlier on. And in forging this collaborative dialogue, um, there are a number of different tools that I've put up on the screen. Now, yes, there are others, but these are some of the basic ones that we've used, that have been successful, for me, for other uh, colleagues, and in other places around the world. We've talked a little about them. I want to go into a little more detail. And uh, again, this is where, please, I'd like your comments and thoughts. I like industry advisory boards. I like industry advisory boards because it lets me, if I'm the university, get the benefit of the knowledge of industry leaders, of the R&D departments of the major companies, to help me guide our applied projects to where the market has a need. I find that companies are happy to participate. They love knowing what's going to come out of the university. It gives them a sense of being part of the future. They don't mind meeting with you. It does, it's not every week. It's not even maybe every month, but it depends. Um, six to eight weeks is usually a good time frame for a short meeting. That's not onerous for them. It's not difficult for them to do. There's no cost involved other than, you know, coffee and a sandwich maybe. 
Nobody needs to be paid to come and do this. They're happy to come and do this. I, I know it looks funny, but in my experience, everybody likes to give advice. We all love to be asked for our opinion. It's human nature. If people actually have an opinion that you care about, all you have to do is ask, and they'll usually be happy to provide it. And if you get enough opinions from people in the relevant industry sector, then you can use that really to the benefit of your projects, to the benefit of your researchers. You'd be amazed at how much information you get just by asking and listening. It was always amazing to me because so often as universities, you come to companies and you want to tell them, you want to teach them, you want to advise them. You want them to learn about the next best thing you have. Try listening. You'd be amazed, firstly, at how much they already know, but secondly, at what they really need. And they will tell you what they need. So that's, again, I know it looks funny when it's up there, but, uh, but it's in their best interests, and they're usually very happy to provide you with that input, and it'll cost you nothing in terms of actual uh, money, which is always the important element uh, for, for a university. The second, and if you will, the um, distilled version of this is what I call a CEO circle. And that I've done successfully in different places actually around the world. And I mentioned that to you briefly before. The idea here is a more, more of a higher level, what I call a helicopter view. So, you know go up to 10,000 feet and you get this view of what the trends are. It won't be as specific as what an industry circle will do for you in terms of the exact things they're working on, but it gives you a very good idea of what the trends are, what the companies are looking for. Now look, publicly traded companies, they publish this information anyway, but very often you'll get some additional input that's not published, and very often you'll get some insight on things that might already be done at your university or at your institute that can be very valuable. It also enhances the reputation of both sides. And I know that looks very shallow, but you'd be surprised at how important that is. People like to be associated with a good university. They like to feel that they're advising and people are listening to them. After all, you're talking about people who will typically serve on boards of governors, maybe, of these institutions. They like to be listened to, and they can provide very, very valuable input. This has to be exclusive if it's going to work. If it's not exclusive, it won't work. You know, it has to be a select club that people want to be a part of. Think of it. It works well for some. Open Research Day's classic mechanism, used all over the world, requires, at this stage it becomes a little more expensive because it does require some work, um, but it's only maybe once a year. And my advice is to do it at the same time every year, whatever, the second week in May, or whatever it is that you choose, make it a time that people can get used to, so that they know that at a certain time of the year, there's a research day at University X, Y, or Z. I, I know it looks a bit obvious, but again, if you have a board of governors meeting in the third week of June, fine, do this in the beginning of that week or the week before, whatever. But it has to be something that people can get used to and they know they're going to. Because you're trying to attract a much broader audience here. Here you want companies. Here you want investors. Here you want even small companies to come and see what the trends are, what's happening, what's new, what's exciting. There are lots of ways of making this fun, of making this more than just, you know, coming to see what's happening. You can open the labs or some of the labs. You can have booths. You can have beta products. There are always two or three things that are exciting. I don't know, batteries for electric cars or... Um, 
jumping frogs. I've seen jumping frogs. I know it doesn't sound like much, but anyway, it was very interesting. Um, it requires you as the commercialization catalyst, as the tech transfer expert, as the liaison between the university and the industry, <coughs> sorry, to do a lot of background work. Because most academics will stand up and talk for too long and in too much detail, and they'll lose the audience. They need to talk sound bites. It needs to be fun. It needs to be exciting. There can be a few slides. There can be a short movie. There can be all sorts of things. There can be a short experiment. Um, it does require a lot of work. But if it's successful, then it provides all of the benefits of the things that we've said before, plus a much broader audience. Think even of the press. We don't like to think of using the press, but you know what? The general press, I don't mean the scientific press, the general press. Yesterday we visited the Open Research Day at the Technical University of Leningrad, and we saw A, B, and C. And there's a picture of Professor X with Machine Y doing, I don't know. Think of what that does not just to companies and on the business side, but to your potential students, to your potential donors, to people who are involved in the whole community. It's very exciting. And there is something about the frontiers of research that are exciting to people who are not there, you know, to the general public. It's exciting. And that creates a lot of goodwill in your community as well. Now remember there are other benefits to that and to other, some of these other things as well. Jobs, you have students, they're looking for jobs. They can meet people. The industry that supports you might want to give scholarships. That happens all the time. They might want to sponsor a potential project. You might even just have access to them. Even if they're not giving you something specific at that point in time, you have access. And remember that if you're the intermediary, that is something that you can offer back to the university. So if you're that yellow circle in the middle with the four blue circles around it that I had earlier on, and you're the intermediary, you're the catalyst, you're offering industry access, you're offering the university something that it might also need that's not directly related to commercialization, but it's a very useful link with industry. So that's another thing to think of, in, and, that, and that's part of what I mean when you're creating these circles of relationships. They're not, they're not linear. They're, it's like throwing a stone in the water, and you know, it, it grows in different ways. Next on this slide is roadshows. The classic roadshow, you go on the road. You, you go on the road, you take a few people with you, and you go and visit the companies. Typically, I recommend focusing on a particular technology, particular industry, sometimes a stage of development, but that's becoming more rare. It needs to be tailored to an audience. For example, you go to six companies in a particular industry with six technologies that you want to show them. This can happen more often because it's more specific. It requires no less work, by the way, because preparing the people to present for this is a lot of work. But that can be very, very useful because you're going to them, you're bringing people to them. It's not cheap because remember, you've got to take the people there, you've got to prepare them and so on and so forth. Because it's not cheap, mostly what I favor and what I've done is reverse roadshows. And I think I have them on the next slide. If not, I'll just talk about them. No, we'll get to that. By reverse roadshows, I mean exactly that, bringing the companies to you. And that we did very successfully. That's the reverse. So you bring one company, for example, the chief technology officer of Siemens, as an example. You prepare very, very carefully for that half day. You won't usually have more than half a day with someone who's that senior. Maybe a full day with someone who's a little less senior. I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now for one of the world's major computer manufacturers coming to, they're actually in Israel this week. I've just arranged it. They're going to go now. We got a wish list from them. Remember the wish list from before? We got a wish list from them. We went and found relevant technologies and projects and patents in institutions. We set up the meetings and then 
The commercialization catalyst, in this case the tech transfer company, has to coach its people so that they speak briefly to the point, not with 30 slides, but with five or eight, and give just a brief overview of what they're doing. And so the company, or in, in this case the computer company, that's a good example, they're sending two people. The people will sit in the same room in the offices of the tech transfer company, and they will hear these presentations at 20 minute intervals. So, you know, each one's about 20 minutes, so it leaves some time for discussion. At the end of that, they will have a good opinion of the institution because there's a lot of stuff that's of interest to them because you've done some homework, you've presented things that are in their areas of expertise. They will have some potential projects that they might want to collaborate on. And you will also create a relationship with people who are decision makers and sometimes with people who will then grow into being you know, more important decision makers. Now sometimes it's not two people, sometimes it's a whole delegation. Now, sort of on a personal note, when I started doing that, there was a lot of resistance within the company. You know, I had 25 employees or so, there was a lot of resistance. It's work that they didn't have to do before. It's hard work. The professors don't really want to be coached on how to present because they present all the time, but they make different presentations. They make scientific presentations. Here you want them to be very concise. It's scientific, but very concise. And no, you don't have to present eight slides of diagrams of, you know, two will do, uh, but very hard. And I remember one of the people said to me, but it's such a waste of time and, you know, it didn't take long to realize that we were, we were getting deals done through this. So this was a good use of time. It's also relatively inexpensive because you're not traveling. You're not out of the office. You just have to do the work. People are coming to you. And in my experience, if you have enough to offer, people will come to you. Companies want to see what you have. Especially if, you're, if you've got institutions of a certain standing. If you've got something that you can say, well, this is the institution that developed X or published Y, or they'll want to hear what you have to say. And you develop these relationships, it's a very effective tool. So I like reverse roadshows. And for me, they've always worked very well. And I still do them a lot with you know, companies that come to Israel that ask for help as a, uh, on a consulting basis. Online dialogue. Well, I mean, that's almost obvious. Um, it's a major tool today. It doesn't create relationships, but it's essential as an information tool so that you can get a dialogue started. It doesn't replace the dialogue, but it gets a dialogue started. And what it also does is it keeps a dialogue going. It's a lot of work because it has to be constantly updated, the news has to be interesting. You want those people to read your messages on email, on LinkedIn, on whatever it is that you're using. But you want them to read your messages and they'll only read them if they're short, if they're to the point and if they're interesting. Otherwise, you know, they won't. How many emails do you get on a regular basis that you delete? You don't want to stop getting them because you want to know they've arrived, but you'll never actually read them. Well, I do for sure because, you know, it's not interesting enough. Sometimes the title is interesting, but the rest is... But sometimes when I get things that, you know, tell me in the headline, we have this and this and that, new results from, new results prove that, um, research uncovers something, it's something you're going to read if it's short, if it's a paragraph. That on an, uh, on an ongoing basis, absolutely essential because your world is all over. You know, you're going to be working with companies all over the world, with investors all over the world. Investors are a lot more difficult than companies. Their retention span is much shorter. So this is absolutely essential. Now what we did, um, and others are doing now also, we linked our own database directly into our online tools. Not automatically, so not everything we put on the database went in the online, but so you're not working twice. So that you're preparing the summaries and the marketing materials for your projects. And with the push of a button, you can shoot them online to the public, to the website, to um, an emailing list, to whatever you want to do. 
it helps. It requires you to have the skill set on board to write those things, and it's not the same sort of writing skills as technical or scientific writing. Um, but it needs to be prepared. You also need to have, for this whole process, marketing materials available for different levels. You need to have a basic non-confidential marketing teaser, if you will, on everything that you want to sell or every service or every potential collaboration that you have that you can send out without requiring complicated non-disclosure agreements. You need to have, of course, confidential material that's ready to go. Response times are essential with industry and with investors. They don't want to have to wait for a week or 10 days or two weeks while you prepare the materials because they're now interested. This all needs to be ready. And it needs to happen on an ongoing basis. And it's a lot of work. And there's always more of that than you want to do. But it has to be done. And if you have that, then it can be standardized. Then it can be linked. Then it can be sent out on the online platforms as well as others. We talked about this. <laughs> Point one, staffing is key. Again, you know, I come back to the same point again and again. You can't do this work without having the right people on board. And I know it's obvious. I know I, know I say it and you say, yeah, well, so what's new? But it's very hard to get these people on board. They're not usually there to start off with. You need those fast response times that I've talked about. You need people who are well-trained in the language of business. You need people who can market Technology, it's not easy to market technology, especially when it's not yet a product. And you need to convince people that it can be a product if they invest in it. I talked about it, I'm gonna say it again, it's up here on the slide, materials need to be standard. You need to have, because you can't invent yourself every time. So you have a standard non-confidential, you have a standard confidential with more detail. This is half a page, this is a page, this is two pages. Um, and it becomes something that you produce on an ongoing basis. Once you've done the first batch, then you know the rest is, is, is maintenance. It becomes easier to do. Um, but that all has to be ready there. And of course, training the academic side is, uh, is one of the tricky parts in all of this. Because you know, at the Nano Israel conference, which I mentioned before, I run a session every time, every conference. That's called Golden Nuggets. And what that is, is really it's a tech transfer session. We take a dozen projects, 12 projects, from all the different centers. And we give each, and the presentations are made by the researchers, by the professors. And we give each one seven to eight minutes to present their project. And these are projects on the verge of commercialization. So. They're sort of finished the research phase. They're about ready for sort of commercialization. And it, the audience is always, it's packed because people want to know what's coming next. And they get from us a template of exactly the number of slides and also generally what we expect them to cover so that they can speak for only seven or eight minutes because otherwise they'll speak for 25 minutes and I cut them off because point being the last one has the same seven minutes as the first one. Um, but you know what? It can be done. It's not easy. It can be done with some training. And then it becomes exciting. It's also fun for them. They always say, well, I've never had to do something like this. Well, but then when investors and companies come up and talk to them because they have this opportunity, it becomes interesting. And that's another thing that you can use. You can use conferences. Business conferences, I don't mean academic conferences. You can use business conferences. You can use networking opportunities in a very major way to, uh, to make this happen. So all of that was the first stage, okay? Different tools to create this dialogue. Second stage is to define what the framework is. What works for that particular technology project product, okay? Because now you understand what the market needs and you think you have something that might work for them, you have a relationship with a potential partner. Now, it's a question of what works for that particular project. We've talked about service contracts. We've talked about sponsored research. We've also talked about collaborative research. And I've explained the differences. They're also mentioned here. 
but essentially it goes from a lower level of collaboration with a lower or no level of IP to a higher level of collaboration with IP involved. Okay, so that's sort of, if you will, the first three stages. I'm not going to go through them again unless there are questions. We've talked also about joint ventures. Is that okay? We've talked also about joint ventures, setting up a new company to exploit a particular technology with an industrial partner. Sometimes that can fit in with the economic development agenda of your university or your local authority or your regional development board. Sometimes they like to see companies. The idea here is that it should be jointly owned but funded by the industrial partner and develop the new technology, like the example I gave you before. A license can be made to any type of company. It can be made to this joint venture. Even if you set up a joint venture, you need to license the technology to the joint venture. It can be made to an existing company. It can be made to a startup company that's founded not together with an industrial partner, but with an investor or with an entrepreneur. That's the classic model. It can be exclusive, it can be non-exclusive, it very much depends on what your technology is and different rules apply. It's also important to understand the area you're in because in some areas you'll have stacked royalties. There will be a number of different patents that a licensee has to get a license to in order to develop a product, in particular today in ICT. And so there have to be provisions in your agreement that make sure you're still making money after they've taken three other licenses. So you've defined the framework. You know more or less what you want to do. Step three, of course, is negotiating the agreement. And I've put a lot of detail on the slide, and I don't know how much of that you want to go into, as to what these agreements will typically contain. Um, do you want me to go into the details? I can, or I can give you this. It's sort of up to you at this point. Um, this is more for tech transfer practitioners, they always have very specific questions. But if I just browse through it, it it's really going from the short term to the longer term and what the elements are that you have to cover in order to make sure that you cover your costs and make money, that you protect your intellectual property as universities and research institutes, and that you provide upside for the other side so they want to continue to work with you for the future. Of course, important element is defining the intellectual property scope and ownership. And what happens if in the future you want to negotiate a licensing agreement based on this. Two approaches, one says let's negotiate it in advance which makes a lot of sense, only sometimes it'll take six months to negotiate, by then they don't want to do the collaborative research anymore. So sometimes you want to say, well, we will negotiate a license in good faith if this is successful. It's a perfectly valid approach. And the same goes for a joint venture type of collaboration, which again, um, has different elements because you're actually setting up a company and you're getting, you know, quote unquote married to your industrial partner because now you have a baby together. And uh, this baby has to be fed and it has to be funded and uh, it continues to exist beyond the actual project. One important element in all of these relationships, and I've mentioned it on the slide, it is customary for any licensee, any business partner, once they take a piece of intellectual property, to pay not only the ongoing costs, so the costs from now on, but also to repay the costs that you've already paid. So if you've already submitted a patent application, maybe a PCT, maybe even something in the national phase, your accounting has to be very clear per project with good systems and databases so that you can present them with what that cost was. And that's separate from the licensing fee or whatever other upfront payments they pay. It's customary, it's standard, they shouldn't argue with you about it. They're 
they want something, they're going to you know, pay you for the actual costs, not cost plus anything, but the actual costs that have been paid for that piece of intellectual property. To most universities, that makes a very big difference because obviously you're being paid back later than you actually paid it. So, you know, it goes into your current earnings of that particular year, especially if it's a, an older patent and the costs are higher. In a license agreement, and I do want to say a few things about a license agreement, some things are important to remember. Not only whether or not it's exclusive, but what the territory is, again, sounds obvious, not obvious. Sometimes you can license something only for the US or Latin America or Europe or Asia or whatever. What the scope is, what they can do with it. What the fees are, not just what I mentioned now of repayment of intellectual property fees, but what they pay you up front, whether there are certain milestones in the development at which time they pay you, whether there's a license maintenance fee, which is a way for the university to get money before they're finished developing a product. Sometimes there's an annual fee. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money. But it helps if a company knows that this is costing them something. It keeps them working. Sometimes minimum royalties. So a certain minimal amount which will be paid and credited back. Royalties will typically be linked to the patent life. And one of the mechanisms that we can use in order to get royalty payments past the life of the patent is what's called know-how payments. They can't be called royalties because there's no patent anymore, say if the patent has expired. But sometimes you can get know-how payments. They'll usually be maybe about half of the royalties. But you can sometimes get them for an extended period of time, and that can be a significant payment worth remembering, at least as a potential mechanism. And as I mentioned this, the licensees may pay the ongoing costs of the intellectual property, but the ownership remains with the university very typically. It's unusual for a university to sell a piece of intellectual property. A lot of licensees don't like that. They want to own it. They want to be able to sell it. But what that enables you to do is to have a clause in the agreement that forces them to do what they have to do. Because, you know, sometimes they'll come to you, and I had this with one of the biggest, biggest companies in the world. They wanted technology from us to make uh, drinks, additives, to make transparent drinks. You know, transparent drinks are today a very big growing trend. So, you know, like Coca-Cola, it's transparent or whatever. They, you know, water that has a flavor. Really, it's a transparent drink, whatever. It turned out in the course of the negotiation that they didn't really want to develop products. More than they wanted to develop products, they wanted to prevent their big competitor from developing products. So what they really wanted to do was a preventative licensing agreement. They wanted to take the technology. But they were not willing to commit to actually developing it. Now. To a university, that's not worthwhile because you'll get some sort of payment. But there'll be no royalties. There'll be little financial gain. And more importantly, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're not getting the technology out for the benefit of the public. It's just going to sit on someone's shelf for commercial competition. And it was interesting because usually you don't know that. This happened, somehow this came out. But um, what you can put in an agreement, even if you don't know that, are clauses that force the licensee, the partner, to develop the product. And if they don't develop the product, you can take the license back. I have done that. I've done that as a small company when I licensed to a big Japanese company and they didn't develop it properly. So we took it back and gave it to someone else. So that was okay. I've done it as a university. Took licenses back, including from very big companies, because they were not developing it. But you have to have a clause in your agreement that says, if you don't do A, B, C, and D, then we can take it back. The license expires, and whatever you've paid, you've paid, and it comes back. Sometimes there's a penalty, but whatever. That's very important. Because if you're renting it out, if you're licensing it out, then you have that control. If you sell it, you have no control. And that is important to a university, to a research institute, to be able to control its intellectual property. 
I think this goes without saying, okay? Um, there are two points on the slide that I do want to highlight because I have not mentioned them before. One is research funding. In addition to whatever your partner pays for the technology, it is customary to get them to fund some ongoing research. They're usually happy to do it because it provides something for the future. It's very good for the professor because, after all, they want funding for their lab and for their ongoing work. And usually it comes from a different budget as well, so they're happy to do it. The other thing that they can do, and very often do, is provide some sort of consulting payment to the professor. That doesn't have to be a lot of money, but it can be quite a nice incentive a consulting payment for a year or two to help with the transfer of the technology. Most universities, I don't know the rules in Russia, but in most countries, they will enable their professors to get that sort of a payment, provided they do it less than maybe one day a week, half a day a week, it depends on the university. The company needs that support, and the professor makes a bit of money along the way. It's good for everyone. The other thing that I want to mention is the one to fourth point on that first, uh, first section, which is the possibility of a sort of subscription payment. Okay? That is something that very few universities can do, only the best, and only those that have a good mechanism for managing it. But they do it at MIT, they do it at Stanford. They have companies that pay an ongoing fee, like a subscription, to be able to take a look at new technologies. So beyond having a research day or having an event and so on, on an ongoing basis, that is a good idea, it works well, it has to be managed, it requires a lot of work because you have to feed them on an ongoing basis, and you have to have enough things that are interesting enough for them to be willing to pay for the information. But I mention it, hopefully we all get there one day. There are, by the way, no Israeli universities that actually have subscription payments. They have ongoing payments for particular projects, but not blanket payments for subscriptions. But that's all on the financial side. There are obviously non-financial gains as well that go to the understanding of the market direction, that go to a better understanding of what the market's actual needs are at the moment. And actually, the important point here is in the middle. It leads to higher rates of commercialization. Typically, commercialization rates run at about 20, 25%, which means of the projects that you have, maybe a quarter will get commercialized, will find partners. We run in Israel at about 30 to 35%, a little higher than average. Projects that the commercialization catalyst, the entity, has decided to invest in, which we haven't talked about so far, those run usually double the commercialization rate. So 60 to 70% of those will get commercialized because they've been pre-selected and you've invested in them and you've, uh, you've taken them to the next level. We'll talk about that gap funding. But by just having this ongoing dialogue, you will have better commercialization rates. I can guarantee it because you'll know what the market's looking for and what it's willing to pay. The gains for industry are obvious to me. You know, I came from industry into this world. And they need this. They need faster development because that's money at the bottom line. They need access to the newest technologies. They need to be convinced that they're winning this competition. And that having access to your technologies will help them win this competition, win this race. And that really, of course it expands their research capabilities as well, but that really is why Everybody wins at the end of all that. I want to leave you with a thought about licensing versus startups. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it a little more forcefully. Universities like to say that they have lots of companies. It's fashionable, it looks good, what have you. It's easy to count. People work and there are logos. It looks really nice. You see, I've put some up there. There are a lot of regional economic development entities that want you to say, well, we have 20 companies, 200 companies, whatever. The truth is that over time, a small number of those will survive. 
when they really have to survive in the real world, when they're not getting money from the regional development, the government, the whoever else. It is better to select those companies in advance. The ones that have a broad enough technology platform that can develop real products, that answer to a real market need, that are able to attract ongoing funding. One of the biggest issues we have in many countries today is there have been all these programs, and I know you have some here in Russia as well, that support the creation of new companies. Wonderful. And they get money for a year or two. And then the money runs out. And then there's no company. If you select, again, you won't always succeed. Even in venture capital, the success rates are relatively low, but you need to pre-select those that you think can succeed, that can be attracted, help them create the relationships. And um, remember that very often, licensing a technology to an existing company is more lucrative. It'll make you more money. It's maybe not as sexy as a startup with a new logo and you know fun stuff and so on, but very often it will create the better payback. So finding the right balance, I'm not against startups, say, remember, venture capital like startups. But I'm against startups that have no merit, that are just created to look good. Um, distinguishing between those two is not easy to do, but it'll make you highly successful. And here are the two little dogs. We don't need an internet startup to make millions. Don't you get it? We're talking dogs. So you know, sometimes it's right there, and all you need to do is see it. The summary really covers a lot of the things that we've talked about throughout. It's not just that working with industry is good for both sides. I think that's obvious by now. I will say, and it's up here on the slide, that it is important to maintain your basic fundamental research. Okay, at the same time, because that, that, that is where the very, very big innovations will come from. But while you're doing all of that, a lot of things will come out of your applied research that can be commercialized. Understanding the strengths and the needs of your institution and of the industry, absolutely essential. Creating an environment that's collaborative. And that goes down to really small things. Fast response times. The response times that industry and investors expect are, well, I'm sad to say, a little different than most universities' response times. People want an answer. If you say you're going to send them something, they want it today. They, it works in a different way. And I know that I did a lot of work on response times, and it made a very big difference in getting the other side to feel that they had someone to work with. Finding the balance between the collaborative research, the licensing, the spin-offs, that comes with experience and based on what you have in your own institution. It varies from place to place, depends on what you have. If you have mostly ICT, internet types of you know, related research, most of that is spin-off. If you have mostly uh, bio research, materials research, physics, most of that probably licensing. But again, that's a very broad uh, generalization. I want to stop at this point so that I can take questions, um, which is really the next section, but there's just key lessons and things there, so I can take them now. No questions. You have a question. Hooray. Wait. I'll ask in Russian because uh, I will. I'd like to be correct in this uh, in this question. So, uh, so the question is. The main paradigm of what we've been talking about today is about the openness to cooperation, and to the search of those areas where we could succeed. And this positive opinion about this collaboration, because we could really have two groups of uh, academia and the business community. And when we worked, when we launched our intersectoral association, we saw some of the companies who are positive to cooperation and the collaboration, and those companies who were not very 
confident and who thought that they, they will just waste their time and this work will not be fruitful. In Engl English, it call, it's called the sh paradigm shift. So the question is, how in the public discussions can we persuade the companies on the one hand not to be afraid of risks of cooperation because they think that somebody will find out about their technology so somebody could get their competitive advantages. We understand their fears. And here is the question of the confidence uh, between the institute and business. As for the national level, every country, every public politician try to protect their national interests and therefore the issue of uh, the international cooperation is always um, stuck when we speak about the brain drainage, about the, when company, our companies, national companies go to other markets, to other countries. How do you make and persuade people to shift from negative attitude toward positive attitude? Sir. In, in the order of the questions. Nothing is more successful than success. And success is contagious. And I say that I'm not to be flippant at all. Simply to say that if you can show, and it's relevant to both your questions, if you can show industry and the academic institutions some success stories, Prove to them that it's worthwhile to be open and to collaborate with each other. That is by far the best way to fast forward the whole process. And sometimes you need to help these successes. Sometimes, as, in, as a catalyst, you should find two or three projects that you think can work and help them happen even help them with some funding sometimes, help them move along. Because once you can prove, and it's always hard to start anything new. And like any relationship, even between people, even between friends, it takes time to build trust. Success builds trust. When, when I wanted, well, slightly different example, but I was looking for projects a few years back, in alternative energy and water, sort of green tech. And I couldn't find any. And then it was December, and we happened to have a million dollars come in from the sale of shares in a company that were, it was not foreseen, it wasn't budgeted. So at the end of our fiscal year, I said, fine, I'm going to take this million dollars and I'm going to invest it in projects in green energy, okay? Green tech. Now, yes. I should have had an open contest and let people submit and request for proposals and blah, 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 and then it would have been June. But I wanted to do it before the end of the year, remember December. So I went around and found a few projects and decided that the first batch of projects we would select. Now I took a couple of very senior industry people to help in the selection process so no one could argue, and some very senior people in academia as well because you want to make sure everybody's happy. We selected six projects. We gave them what is a relatively large amount of money, up to $200,000 a project, which is a lot of money in academia for a project on the verge of commercialization. And you know what? Most of those projects got commercialized. Why? I agree. It was not a straightforward process that you would normally do if you were planning something in advance. But it was important to show success. It was important to show it quickly. It was also important to put our hands on the money before it went into the general budget for, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's what we did. And now, once it was successful, then, you know, it was easy to do the next one and the next one, and then you can do it the proper way. So the parallel here is to say, maybe you find two or three projects. You help them happen. Maybe not in an open call, maybe not. And it's okay, because once they happen, once they're successful, you call it a pilot project, no one can, can argue. Whenever it's a pilot project, no one can argue, because it's never quite by the same rules uh, as you will have in the future. But those projects can help you as an example, and you can use them. So I think that's true for the first one, or first part of your question. For the second part of your question, 
Look, there is no one good answer for nationalism. I mean, certainly I, uh, I wouldn't attempt it myself. But business is international. And I think most governments today realize that, even if they want to maintain most of the brain power locally. For us, most of our licensees of our universities are international companies. There are a few Israeli companies, but most of them are small. And again, success speaks because if you can show that a leading Russian university or a company or a member of your association has a significant relationship with a big player in the mobile, materials, whatever, there are lots of different relevant industries. I don't think there'll be many questions asked. I don't think the question will be, oh, why are you working with Royal Dutch Shell and not with Gazprom? Like, that question will not be asked because success speaks for itself. So you can't, I think you need to attempt to do what's best for your stakeholders. In this case, the companies or the universities or the people that you are working with. And on the best terms that you can. And understand that the benefit of opening up global markets is greater than the benefit of doing one particular deal with one particular local company. And I think that's an argument that you can use. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it's an argument that you can use. Does that help? Questions? I have a question. What's the driver of innovations? What's the key driver of innovations? The com competition between industrial corporations or the competition between the institu institutes or both? Or is it a global problem? I mean, the, the worldwide, I'd rather say. In my opinion, in we have quite tough competition between uh, academia, between universities to be the, among the top universities. And uh, now we have innovation criteria and we have also large corporations. State and we have state programs of innovations to have those companies involved in those programs. So they feel quite well. well. But what do you think? How, when we have such a competition between universities, when we have uh, gas and oil industry, which is quite strong, I believe Rosnana integrates business and education. Here we have representatives of universities who implement this difficult uh, task. And so we do attempt. So this is my question. What do you think? What's the driver in this situation? So your idea is to take a project and to go to give and to teach the professors. I absolutely agree with you. Of course, this is a tough work. It's hard to share your uh, our ideas. But speaking about the the state, the global problem when we have uh, strong corporations which feel quite well, how to make this process more efficient? This is my question. Well, you asked about the drivers for innovation. And I think the drivers are broader than just industry competition or academic competition. We started out a few hours ago talking about the fact that the way the world is progressing now, the population growth, the issues, hunger, disease, energy, we have to innovate. We have to innovate in order to survive. You know, it's like running on a treadmill. If you stop, you fall off. And we're on a treadmill. We all are. The world is on a treadmill. And it's moving faster and faster. That was that graph that I showed, you know, going up. Different types of competition fuel different players. You know, 
the competition among universities is not usually about innovation per se, it's usually about the classic academic outputs that are measured. Competition between companies is financial. Competition between nations has all of the above, you know, in competition between nations. But I think the reason the world is so interested in the whole issue of innovation now is that it's a given that we all have to move forward. What we're trying to figure out is the best way for each one nation, each one area, each one region to move forward. There are strong arguments being made that when you come to the question of innovation, it's not a national question. It's a global question, it's a regional question. It can't be within national boundaries because those are you know, artificial, quote unquote. I think there's, there's a ways to go before we get there. The world still is fairly nationalistic in its, in its, uh, in its views. But I do think that if, if the question is not just the philosophical question of what drives innovation, but how do we drive innovation within our ecosystem, um, it is very hard to start. It's very hard to get these different entities to speak to each other. But uh, look, you have a title that didn't exist a few years ago, right? I don't think there was a vice rector for innovation. Am I correct? Certainly not in most universities that I know. good. <laughs> no. So that to me, in and of itself, is a sign of progress. Because you didn't do that by yourself. You are part of a very well-established, a very old university, when I talked about we've been doing things this way for 200 years, that's a classic situation. So your university, with all of its might, has come to the conclusion that it needs to have a very senior person thinking about innovation, pushing innovation. It's, it's happening already. You know, it's not even a question of what are the drivers. It's happening already. Look, it's happened at your institution. It's happened, the vice dean sitting next to you, the same thing. You're there already. It's part of the process that's happening. You've got that remit. You've got that responsibility. Um, it might not be happening as fast as you'd like or in uh, with the same results that you'd eventually like to see, but it is happening. So then the question becomes, not the big philosophical question, but the practical question of what measures can we put in place, what incentives can we put in place to make our institutions move maybe faster, to make them achieve the results. And there I believe that there are a few different elements, but one important one is what are the goals? What are the milestones that you set? because I showed you earlier on the example of the National Nanotechnology Program in Israel. The interesting thing about that is that it only achieved these scientific and business goals at the same time because they were set out in the beginning. After all, if you had started six academic centers without setting business goals, only academic goals, well, firstly, you wouldn't know, right? Because you wouldn't measure them, so you wouldn't have that data. But secondly, you probably wouldn't have that focus either, because it's not natural to have that dual focus. So a lot of it depends on what goals you set and what incentives you give to the people. And there are a lot of things that can be done, enabling them to consult outside of the university one day a week. That's classic. That happens all over the world. Usually they don't teach every day anyway, so you know they can do that. And they can make extra money that way, which is very nice for everyone. Providing assistance um, for that. We used to provide also negotiations and so for these consulting agreements, which had two purposes, of course. One was to provide an incentive, but the other one was to keep a lid on what was happening so that we knew who was working with who and that there was no you know, competition happening there. Um, you can provide um, certain maybe funding incentives, so to let to help start activities, to help do transitional research, to help fund maybe you know a student that goes out and starts something, to get 
the business school involved with the technical side of the university providing business assistance to make market research business plans to support the creation of new products there are a lot of different things that can be done even within the university you know within a system or in collaboration with an a sister university um, that can really help move things along and mostly to create the sense that this is worthwhile that this is appreciated that there's an outcome from this that's worth their while i think you know for me those are some of the things and that sense of success it's not always financial that's why i talked a little before also about the press i i know it sounds funny but people like to read about themselves in the newspaper they like to read about their successes people younger people for sure they like competitions you know a student competition on an innovative project that you know you select one project and you give it some funding it's classic it's done all over the world it's successful when it's properly run so a lot of measures that can be put in place to create you know what the americans like to call a buzz a, you know a sense that something's happening that it's exciting that you want to be part of this because that's the direction the university is going when i talked before about successful countries and regions the same is true to successful organizations it's the top level commitment it's the approach it's the fact that what you do is broadly respected and considered so i know these are very general terms but they can be broken into very practical tools you know as a different example when we wanted to create a public awareness of the nanotechnology in israel um a few years back i think it was the second conference that we were doing we added a nano art exhibition and competition you know what i was on national television on the news and all the newspapers and so because of the nano art so they invited me to talk about nano art and i said two words about nano art and then i talked about whatever i wanted to say you know about the the field and so on but it was a way to make it exciting to the general public to you know so in in the same way this is easier because innovation is something everybody likes to hear about but um i think that if you you need to make it you know cool you need to make it attractive and uh, and because it is basically attractive and because you have students and students are you know they want to be part of this they're connected to the world um and there are a lot of international pro- programs that you can be connected to as well that creates a buzz and i think a lot of it will come from the students trickling up does that help i need i need my english sorry there yeah. i come sure sure thank you very much we are already doing a lot towards this goal and it was very pleasant to hear from you that it brings results another question in your opinion who is more successful china or israel in in, in implementing innovations um well if you ask the chinese they'll say israel you know that um they are in and out of israel all the time um strangely they have a very low opinion of themselves as innovators i say strangely because to me china's gone through such a major change and shift and so on and it's true that a lot of it is based on maybe copying existing technologies but that's about to change um but they don't perceive themselves as being innovative it's interesting they don't they don't have that perception of themselves um and they're always coming to us and asking for advice and uh, sending people and uh, having israelis come and start incubators and funds and so it is you know so from that point of view i don't think that they perceive themselves as playing in the same field they see themselves more as a manufacturing economy rather than an innovative economy to me that's changing as we speak спасибо спасибо thank you спасибо Thank you. In that case, I'd like to thank you all. It's been fun. 
It's been interesting. And uh, I hope to come back to Moscow when it's warmer. Спасибо вам большое. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very interesting.